Hello everybody, I'm the Neon Hunter, and welcome to the film Fan Theories Iceberg Explained. So, I've basically been looking through loads of icebergs, loads of Iceberg Explained videos, particularly, you know, conspiracy theories ones, just all sorts, disturbing, creepy ones, you know, unexplained mysteries, loads of stuff, loads of different icebergs, and... I've not seen one on the film fan theories, uh, Iceberg. I've seen film ones, disturbing film ones, but I've not seen a film fan theories one um, explaining them. I know some people like Maker, he was going to do one. Uh, there was one on his poll um, that he did recently, or poll that he did recently on his community tab. <clears throat> and I just thought I could do one, you know, because... I love films as you guys know um and it's just fun just fun i love these kind of videos and i want uh you know people to be able to watch a video about film fan theories basically in an iceberg video because i love iceberg videos and i've been really enjoying them so here we are before we jump into the video today i would like to talk about the ebay page big brush films have you found it difficult to find cheap films well this video's sponsor will certainly be able to meet those wants and needs through my ebay link below you can find the ebay seller big brush films who offers wonderful deals on films like the shining or dune both in 4k by treating yourself or someone you love to an early christmas present of goodfellas only for three pounds or three us dollars 90 through the link below you can find get these titles at a low price while supporting me I'm very passionate about being able to purchase films even if you don't have a lot of money so this sponsor really fits those tenets and those ideals through the link below you can finally get these titles at a low price while supporting me you'll also be supporting a small business as big rush films offers their collection of films with a 100% rating from 11,000 users all on eBay with no corporate influence at all Thank you to eBay and Big Brush Films, and thank you very much to anyone who considers purchasing anything from the link below. It really means a lot to me. And thank you for just watching the video and just being here in general. Obviously, this isn't mandatory at all. I just appreciate you guys being here. But yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you, eBay, and thank you, Big Brush Films. All right, let's get into the video. Darth Jar Jar. Now, this theory basically posits that Jar Jar Binks from the prequel trilogy uh, of Star Wars is a Sith Lord and was a Sith Lord all, all along and basically undercover, like an undercover agent. Um, lots of people have said this is the case because it just doesn't make any sense why he's so acrobatic and nimble and good uh, at fighting um, and how he's so close to the to the Jedi and why, really? Like, it doesn't really make much sense if you think about it. Um, and even, you know, Liam Neeson has said that uh, Jar Jar did go to the dark side. That's, that's a quote from him. And the guy who actually played uh, Jar Jar himself, Ahmed Best, who actually got a lot of abuse, which is fucking horrible. Uh, he actually said, I will say this, it feels really good when the hid hidden meaning behind work is seen. Um, when asked about the theory. So this is basically confirmed. I mean, I kind of see it as confirmed, especially if Liam Neeson literally said that he went to the dark side i mean you can't really get to like much closer than that right so yeah it's a good one james bond is a code name so this one is pretty self-explanatory uh it essentially theorizes that james bond isn't his real name um and is simply an alias that 007 uses even though 007 is clearly his code name do you know what i mean um like, why would he need two code names if he's already got one and it's a number? I mean, there doesn't it doesn't get more cryptic than a number, right? Um, it's also been debunked because in Skyfall, you can actually see his parents' gravestones, uh, which they actually have the last, main, last name uh, Bond. So, I mean, why would they have code names too? So it's basically been debunked already. But it's an interesting one. I mean... It kind of sounds like a code name, and given the fact that you know so many car uh, actors have played him, I can understand that. But then again, so many actors have played 007, and I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not a big Bond fan in terms of like all the films. I love Skyfall, but um, I think I don't. I'm not sure if all of them were actually called James Bond, uh, because 
you know, all of them were, I think all of them were referred to as 007, but I'm not sure if every, every one of them used James Bond uh, as as their name. So th that I think is more consistent than James Bond being used, at least from my speculation, because uh, I think 007 was used more. Could be wrong, but yeah, this is basically being debunked anyway. Um, yeah. Every Disney film is connected. Now, there's basically two, the Pixar theory and the uh, every Disney film is connected. They're basically the same th exact thing. So I think I'll just cover this now. It basically just says that the Pixar theory is that every Pixar film is uh, connected in the same world. And every Disney film is connected says the same thing just with Disney films. And basically, you know, Pixar and Disney have lots of different corporations, lots of different brand names. Uh, locations that have been used in the same film like for example i think in monsters inc you can see bnl is used in monsters inc yeah bnl shows up in toy story 3 and monsters inc uh in multiple of them i think the arcade from toy story 2 is also uh, uh that the name of that arcade is also used in other uh films from what i remember um, and also in like uh, the Hunchback, I think in the Hunchback of Notre Dame, you know, Bella, I think from Beauty and the Beast is in that uh, stuff like that. Basically, I might be I might be wrong about that. Um, but basically, you know, there's just so many of them that it's like hard to just list them all off. And it's just kind of like there's no point in listing them all off because it's kind of just true at this point because it's so like not subtle. But it's an interesting one. It's a really interesting one to think like all those characters coexist, you know, like Nemo's knocking around when uh, Woody's hanging out or whatever. Uh, Buzz Lightyear. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's an interesting one. And I mean, it's basically, it's basically, conf in my mind, it's, it's my, you know, it's kind of canon in my mind is just so there's so many connections in both disney and pixar i'm not sure if pixar and disney have uh coexisted in the same world because obviously the disney universe is different from the pixar universe um but this doesn't cover that this covers this the the two the pixar theory and every D disney film is connected not pixar and disney live in the same world so i don't think they're referring to that but nonetheless very interesting very cool the Shining shows that Kubrick faked the moon landing. So this one is probably like the most popular uh, theory, film fan theory, like of all time, I'd say. You know, it's kind of a meme at this point in, in just society, you know. Oh, Kubrick did the moon landing just because he did 2001 and it was incredibly impressive for the time. That instantly means he did the fucking moon landing. It doesn't make any sense. Um, but people think that it does because, you know, room 237 in uh, The Shining represents 237,000 miles. Uh, f the moon is 237,000 miles from the Earth uh, at the time that they made that. I think it's actually higher now. And basically, you know, uh, there's a part where, uh, of, well, there's the infamous part where um, Jack, uh, the character, not Jack Nicholson, well, technically both, but he's uh, in his peak of insanity uh, at the at the hotel. At, is it, I think it's called the Outlook Hotel. I haven't seen it for a while. I've, I love Kubrick, but I haven't seen it in a while. People think that because... Uh, He's, he writes, uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. The all, <laughs> this is fucking crazy. The all, A-L-L, -L, means Apollo 11, <laughs> which I think, uh, <laughs> I just love that one because it's the most, it's the most, uh, obscure thing, uh, ever. Um, and the, the reason they think he did it through The Shining is because he felt so guilty, but he knew if he owned up to it, he would be in deep duty with the CIA and everything, the government. And But he just felt so much guilt that he needed to admit it in some way, so he did it through The Shining. Um, I think it's a really good one. Uh, but also, like, 
why did he wait so long to to do it you know what i mean like why did he wait until uh like because the moon landing was 1969 i think uh 2001 came came after the moon landing or is it 1968 was 2001 but i don't understand why let's have a look here so he had made yeah he had made you know a clockwork orange barry linden films like that like two films before like going i feel really guilty about this so it, it you know why didn't he feel guilty straight away and why did it take him so long to admit it and like do you know what i mean like surely you would feel guilty straight after it wouldn't go maybe it taxed on his mind for long enough but you know it just doesn't make any sense you know that he made a cocker orange yet and barry linden two films um before the shining which would be the ultimate you know admit admittance that he did do it uh by by the this theory standards but interesting one don't believe it but it's an interesting one nonetheless the merchant is the genie so this one is basically saying that the merchant in aladdin is the genie like a manifestation of him a physical version of him um and this one has been confirmed by the director of aladdin uh who said you know that they actually had a scene in mind um with this being confirmed basically so yeah interesting one uh but yeah rest in peace robin williams absolute fucking legend um i'm not sure when he actually passed away yeah he died quite quite a lot after aladdin nonetheless i it's just so sad that we lost robin williams when we did um and uh yeah he's just such a such an amazing guy such a talented actor but uh rest in peace to him uh not that you know the fact that he died lots after means anything i was just interested as to how far ago he actually made aladdin before like um before he died because i know he there was a second aladdin film uh and i don't think he played the genie in it but um yeah, i remember watching that on vhs at some point went to a place cabin where they had it on vhs anyway uh yeah it's an interesting one and just yeah pretty cool pretty nifty one child's is the thing so in the thing uh the thing is essentially a shape-shifting uh monster alien being that we don't actually know uh the origins of uh essentially this theory is saying that because childs which is one of the he's one of the main cast main characters uh that is in the base that they're at um and that gets invaded by this this creature um because he's not present for most of the film or most of the climax i should say people think that he is the thing or that he is just another uh, manifestation of it or the other way around I don't see how he could be the thing, if that makes sense, because, like, are they saying that maybe he was uh, camouflaged as Childs, like the thing, like Childs never existed, or are they saying that at the end he is the thing? I don't, I don't know what they mean, because surely it should be the thing is Childs. Not the other way around. Does that make sense? But it's an interesting one because you know, obviously, he's not he's not present for most of the most of the the climax of the film, the main the main you know fight of the film. But so I absolutely love the thing, love The Shining for that matter. But um, it's a great great film, amazing theory. But obviously, like some people think, and rightfully so, because he's the only black character in the film, you know. It's a bit racist, which I completely, I completely understand. I don't think it's racist, really. I think it's more just about... I don't think it has anything to do with it, but I can understand why people feel like that. Um, yeah, interesting one, and definitely want to think about when, when re-watching. Um, yeah. Dark Side of the Moon Sinking. So the album by Pink Floyd, uh, 
Dark Side of the Moon, which is one of my favorite albums of all time, one of the best albums of all time, actually syncs perfectly to a lot of films. One of the, the most famous ones being uh, The Wizard of Oz. For example, when um, Brain Damage is played, uh, it starts around the same time if, of If Only I Had a Brain which is kind of creepy and crazy and just the amount of synchronization there is is almost perfect in a way to, to the wizard of oz nonetheless producer alan parsons thought it was funny because uh when asked about it because the tapes weren't even available at the time of the album's release like there's like they'd basically have to go to the cinema at a some place that was playing it i suppose they could get it on film maybe but um yeah he thought it was funny because it was basically not possible to even do that and it would probably take a f loads of work just to synchronize to an old film that i don't think they had a lot of uh you know inspiration from with their albums um but it's a very very interesting one very interesting one um quite disturbing if you look into how perfectly synced they are. Um, and uh, I think it would be really interesting to just listen to the whole album with, you know, Wizard of Oz. Um, yeah, really weird, really weird one. The Joker is a war vet. So I think this was thir first uh, theorized by the user on Reddit, Invincible, Invincible Elliot, or Invisible. Or at least that's like the 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 main place I could find it at, uh, and it's it basically sparks the idea that the Joker, which was played by the late Keith Ledger, also a legendary actor, rest in peace, is a war veteran, and it would actually make a lot of sense with a lot of the things from the film. And he basically says that because of his perfect planning and strategy from the height of the beginning of the film to even the the end of the film, um, and how the system works, uh, and just how good he is at planning things out and how perfect the timing is for everything it's almost like rhythmic especially at the the high to the beginning of the film when he leaves perfectly with all the other um school buses things like that uh are just too well planned for just you know uh, uh an anarchist uh, the, well the greatest anarchist of all time you know uh that he has to be a war veteran and he and he knows the system so well that it, al it almost is clear that he's been a part of the system, right? That he's a part of the military, uh, which would which would make it clear why he knows the system so well, you know, of government, of uh, everything, right? Uh, and also, he he's so perfect with the movement during the scene where uh, the military are uh, in the street. And they're perfect. They're they're uh, doing the the ritual, the march thing. I can't think of what it's called just at this moment. Um, and they're doing the salutes and you know putting their guns up. He perfectly uh, matches up to that and does it so uh, so perfectly and knows exactly when to to shoot the the uh, the or not shoot but reveal Bruce in in the in the window up in the building um that it's like kind of like you know it, it's almost genius and he is i think i think joker and and just anything is just like almost a genius of like planning and a genius of anarchy and he's just so good uh at knowing timing and knowing when to do things and why and how that is it's just it can it goes to show how, why he's like the perfect uh, match against batman right to foil batman that he knows exactly how to twist things and how to shock batman um not just in the dark knight right in the comics he's always you know doing that um and he's always he's always one step ahead of batman in a way and and knows exactly how to pull his strings um and it's, it's just goes to show how perfect he is. But uh, the origins of that are, are clear, you know, that it, it could be 
a military uh, he could be a military vet and we b we all know that joker has multiple choice uh origins you know if i were to have my origin if i were to reveal my origin it would be multiple choice right we know he's an unreliable narrator even in joker 2019 right we know he's unreliable we know that he basically can't be trusted in terms of his own origins so i think it's really really interesting that that could be the third multiple choice you know i'm getting hyped just thinking about this it's really cool um you know that could be his third multiple choice uh uh origin right but yeah it's definitely something to th really really think about um when you know when re-watching the dark knight for the nine million two hundred thirty third freaking time do you know what i mean because i've seen the dark knight um i was actually talking to a good good friend of mine filmmaker uh friend very good friend of mine and you know he we were talking about how many times we'd watch the dark knight and it's just like uh, especially when we were younger you'd you just w when you didn't have anything to do you go i want to watch the dark knight again you know what i mean it's i don't know if anyone feels the same way but amazing film amazing film not my favorite batman film you know i think we all know we'll see so what my favorite and you can probably see the batman poster there actually i'm quite thirsty but yeah it's not my favorite batman film uh the batman uh is definitely my favorite but it's still an amazing film willy wonka is a killer have you ever found it weird that basically every child that goes along to the factory in charlie in the chocolate factory or willy wonka in the chocolate factory i think the american version is called um dies i mean everyone but charlie dies they, they're dead they, they get murdered basically or manslaughtered whatever um basically this theory supposes or or posits or says theorizes that willy wonka deliberately murders these kids kills these kids um basically tempting them uh with each of their their respective obsessions their respective uh goals i suppose you could say uh and and yeah obsessions with with uh whatever it is material goods you know food you know sort of gluttony there's there's you know every kid has their own their own sort of obsession same with the adult adults actually um and he's picking them off one by one based on their weaknesses because he knows their weaknesses um so yeah this this one's definitely got me thinking the most because it would kind of make sense why he does everything he does and why because he's he's mostly like a hermit from what i remember um and, and it makes sense why he's like kind of coming out of retirement or whatever just to do these things um and that's basically to give moral justice right uh and to kill these kids uh it's <laughs> I'm not getting monetized, but I don't give a shit. Fuck you, YouTube, you fucking cunt. Um, and I think it's really, it's really interesting uh, because it just seems so deliberate and it just seems so meticulously planned. And it, he's just quite, quite the like uh, uh, uncaring person um, and just very eccentric and, and sort of morally justifies his own his own sort of you know slaves basically with the impa Lumpers. and i think that um it's really interesting and it's it's almost like he's ridding the world of these terrible people and he's like making an example of them you could say um and it's just i just find it really interesting because it's almost like i don't know like a psychopath who it's like it's like an assassin who justifies every person he kills Kind of thing and i always find those kind of characters really really interesting uh almost like kill bill in a way you know the bride from kill bill so yeah it's really really interesting one and it's it's interesting how charlie's the only one left over and the reason he's left over is because he's a good person and he doesn't have any moral weaknesses you know like he's not morally messed up um 
and he's in, and he's innocent, right? But the only question is like, why didn't he kill off all the adults as well? You know, um, maybe to to he killed the kids just to leave them alive to teach them a lesson, to go, yeah, that you you raised a bad kid and you're you're a horrible person. I'm gonna kill your kid and leave you alive to 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 like morally torture you. <laughs> that's really fucked up. <laughs> Um, maybe that's maybe that's what it is. I'm not sure, but it's a really interesting one, and I think that uh, I don't know. It's it's just crazy. It's a crazy one, but it it kind of makes sense in a way, uh, like a lot of these actually. But yeah, Boba Fett killed Owen and Baru. So perhaps one of the most horrific scenes in the whole Star Wars saga, I'd to even say, um, is. The scene in which uh, uh, Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru are burnt to a crisp, uh, obviously off screen, but we see their charred remains just sitting on the porch, um, in in uh, on the porch in uh, Luke's home, basically, and their home in A New Hope, and I think it's just such a poignant uh, turning point for for the whole saga because I mean that's when. That's when Luke knows he has to go into the resistance and become a rebel, and uh, that that's when he starts his journey to become a Jedi, and it's it's just such a big turning point, and it's really it's a really interesting theory to think that Boba Fett did it, uh, and you know given given George Lucas's you know meticulous uh, planning of just the whole the whole trilogy in terms of you know. Uh, everything lining up to the future events and uh, sort of everything making sense with the characters and the world sort of joining together even though you know characters haven't been seen uh, or like their intentions haven't been seen they just match up because he's you know planned it all out um, is it, it would make sense it would make sense but it's actually been disproven because there's this book that came out is it, i can't think of what it's called but it was released in 2017 um i think it's called uh, uh something stories small stories or something i apologize for not having the source there um and it, it basically covers boba fett's timeline during the event uh or events and it's clear that vader told fett no disintegrations um so he could identify any remains you know if if he was going off and killing whoever vader told him to so he wouldn't have charred their bodies because he said no disintegrations uh so it's clear that it, it, it wasn't him or uh, it just doesn't wouldn't make sense or maybe he killed him and then some stormtroopers came along and were like oh, we're bored and they charred their remains but then they'd get it just wouldn't make sense so um it, it clearly wasn't him uh or at least 90 percent it wasn't because vader said that but either way it's it's a really cool ked han ked hannon <laughs> it's a really cool head cannon to sort of keep in mind because i mean who doesn't love Boba Fett and with you know Book of Boba Fett out now and just much more coverage of him which is amazing and the amazing actor who plays him now I can't think of his name I think it's Tamara or something really good actor that plays him uh really well and played uh Jango Fett as well it would it's just a very cool canon uh and it it's just really cool when you know original trilogy things sort of come back and sort of stream back to to other events um so yeah it's really cool really cool to think about and uh, interesting one the shining is about indigenous genocide so we've already touched on the shining once uh and this one basically it, this one is almost certainly true uh there's so much indigenous art uh and symbolism throughout the film that it's it's crazy um it's an incredibly layered film, The Shining, as we know, uh, with so many themes that can be extracted from it, you know, sort of insanity, uh, the twin dilemma of, like, being two kinds of people. Um, obviously, abuse, domestic abuse, uh, and all sorts of almost 
temporal incidents, you know, uh, and just very, very strange and off-putting incidents. You know, the bartender, uh, the scene in, in the bathroom when uh, Jack is talking to him, obviously the infamous Room 237 scenes, multiple, the Red Room scene. Just It's just such an iconic film, and there are just so many different things you can pull from those and this is by far the most relevant one because it's literally has evidence throughout the film that's evident you know with all the indigenous art that's throughout you know the lobby even during uh the elevator scene there's indigenous art right next to the elevator doors right and the the blood is basically and i like to think this is the case for sure is the blood of all the indigenous people that died in its symbolism for colonialism. And I think that adds so much to the film because the film has this airiness to it and this pace that's very, very slow. And it almost, it's like one of the films that uh, Kubrick has done that is almost completely objective, you know? It's a very, very objective experience of a film. And, you know, obviously that infamous scene at the end uh, which I think is almost like a temporal incident, a, a, a time-traveling incident of Jack becoming, or Jack is uh, the the colonialist in the the photo. When I think the the Overlook, the hotel they're in uh, from 1921 was opening. Um, some people think he's a reincarnation of that of that version. Um, and it just it would make a lot of a lot of sense and obviously there's there's a lot of death symbolism of death murder you know the murder that could be red rum could be a reflection of the murder that happened there before with the colonialists murdering people the people of that land uh, and obviously the the death the death showing up the skeletons showing up or the dead members of what i think is the hotel and you know, I, it, the only thing is it wouldn't really explain the strange nature of, you know, the scene with that, that big uh, bear furry. Um, and I think uh, that that's the only thing that's really not discovered. I also think, come to think of it, you know, more filmmakers need to come and think of talking about animals, need to respect animals more in the film industry. Like, it's an essential. Animal cruelty is horrible in this industry. So talk about it and it's just absolutely horrible i've done a lot of uh, research on that um and i'm sure kubrick was a part of that just because he was uh, he just didn't care about anything but his films i think we all know that given the abuses he's done to his actors so i would be very surprised if he didn't have a huge part of that but i don't mean not to speak ill of the dead but it's probably true and we can learn from it by not doing that you know by by not having animal cruelty but anyway talk about that be a part of 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 being against that because people don't talk about it nearly nearly enough uh anyway yeah that that scene wouldn't make much sense but i suppose that could be symbolized in a lot of ways and that could have a deeper meaning too um for which I can't think of right now, but it's a very, very interesting theory. Um, and I just, I just think that it, it gives so much more to the film and it gives so much more relevance to the film. Uh, and we can still take things from it today. You know, the indigenous people are still not being treated well, obviously. And, um, we can still take things from that. You know, we can still take themes from that we can still take lessons from that uh and i think it, i know for sure going back watching the shining which i think i will do soon it's gonna be something that's definitely on my mind uh, which is really cool kevin McAllister became jigsaw it's obviously clear you know that jigsaw at least to me is quite the horror film villain you know he's up there with your michael myers and your freddy krueger's which i also haven't seen his the film as well uh What's it called? God, I'm going to get a lot of shit for this. I can't remember the name of it now. But he's really up there, is what I'm trying to say, you know. Uh, Michael Myers being one of my favorite. Halloween is one of my favorite films of all time. Um, so Jigsaw is really up there. And obviously Home Alone, for us, sort of 
kids that grew up around that era or even you know people that didn't grow up or grew up around that era i was watching seinfeld it was in that you know what i mean it's it's quite a popular film um it's it's interesting that two popular and well-known properties are colliding like this in such a such a almost perfect way into where you kind of you, you kind of believe the theory so the basically the theory is uh that because kevin in home alone enjoys like you know trapping and uh sort of almost torturing these these uh, robbers that he kind of gets a taste for it and later on becomes jigsaw who his main thing is like you know do you want to play a game which i think he never actually said i think i saw a mandela effect thing about that um and as a result basically became that that serial killer and the reason he i looked it up actually thinking what could possibly be the reasons as to why he would become a ser you know a serial murderer um who loves torturing people and jigsaw actually targets people he knows personally so what if right get this kevin he started to like get a taste for it after home alone and the home alone films and um he went after his parents or something because obviously his parents are the the cause of the trauma right because they left him behind because they're assholes uh and it, he started to pick off people in his personal life that he morally disagreed with and um that's kind of jigsaw's thing he like you know he doesn't see it as killing he sees it more as justice you know kind of like riddler in the batman um and as a result puts people through these trials and if they get out of it you know i mean they can live which would kind of make sense because he didn't start killing like he didn't start off killing people he started off by or it started off in this in the guise of this in the world of this theory uh he he really started off trapping people do you know what i mean and he started off uh enjoying that so it wasn't it wasn't like he killed people and that was the first thing because that wouldn't make as much sense because jigsaw leaves people the choice or leaves people the tiny chance to survive so when it's not that he enjoys the killing more uh, i think he does but uh, and again like i said i haven't seen the films but it's it's an interesting one because it would make sense the the events there um so and it, it would also make sense out, out of like an almost like fuck you to society you know it's an act of vengeance revenge uh, that he's going out and he's torturing all these people and it's almost like yeah you know what i mean like it's it's uh again it's kind of like the riddler in in his his origin it's like a lot of uh a lot of anti-heroes you know red hood is a great example uh and maybe perhaps you know there is a little bit in there of him liking jigsaw puzzles in the lore of home alone that people can take apart and that's why he calls himself jigsaw and he wants people to know why he started doing this almost and say fuck you to the very the very first event like again you know batman as well obviously he doesn't kill people he's not as as um uh tortuous and as twisted as jigsaw or riddler for that that matter even though they're very similar um it's kind of it's kind of like that it's it could be at least but yeah this is a really interesting uh theory really like this one han is force sensitive hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side kid that was a terrible han solo impression and i did try my best i try my best all the time you know han is not only known to have beat the kessel run in over 14 parsecs Twelve. Okay. I don't even know where that come from. I'm sorry. Okay, twelve parsecs. How do they even? F anyway, fucking hell. Um, don't want to get on the bad side of fucking Han. Do you know what I mean? Jeez, I'm sorry. Um, he's known basically, essentially, to be a legend amongst pirates, amongst men, you know, uh, scavengers, anyone, right? everyone knows about him everyone knows at least after the original trilogy um he's a legend among men 
uh, and his piloting skills are almost on the level of Anakin and Luke. And I know, you know, people are going to sort of shoot me down. Anakin and Luke, I should say. People are going to shoot me down because everyone, you know, is like, oh my god, you know what I mean? He's not better. He's not on the same level, but he almost is. I mean, look at the asteroid field scene. Uh, it's ridiculous, the odds there. Um, C-3PO even, you know, says it himself, right? Uh, and to, to be able to make it through with those odds, you sort of, you know, you know get a little inkling because of Rey, Anakin, and Luke's... Forget about Rey, really. Cause that, you know, uh, Anakin and Luke's ability... You almost think, well, hold on. Um, he could be force sensitive. The reason he is so good at being a pilot is because he's force sensitive. Um, and it would kind of make sense with with everything that's going on, I suppose. And like, it's sort of never mentioned, like it's never brought up. It's never even queried. So it would kind of make sense if like, it was true because technically, you know, it's never been talked about, so you can't really refute it. And you know, Obi Wan couldn't have, maybe could have picked up on it, but again, you know, he's probably pushed it away, pushed that idea away, and that maybe perhaps that's why that line is in there—the one about hokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for good blastery, psych kid. Maybe that is is actually to indicate that he's pushing this away. With the force, maybe. No, I'm joking. He's pushing the, these ideas of being force sensitive away. Personally, I don't like this one because I think it takes away like basically everything from the character. The whole point of Han to me is that he's like a badass motherfucker who, like, you know, against all the odds, he's like fucking going through uh, asteroid fields. He's like the best pilot. He's like destroying fucking Tie Fighters in his wake. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, saving Luke in the end of uh, A New Hope, uh, making the castle run, obviously. Just all the amazing things he's done, not only in the original trilogy, but the sequel trilogy as well. It just takes away from that, I think, the charm of his character. Uh, it's like seeing Mando is, like, Force-sensitive. It's like, that's... Like, bro, he's so cool because he's, like, mastered all this. He's so cool because he's, like... I like those not you know what i mean like he's against it all but he still fucking does it and like that's what's really cool about those characters right with luke we we get an inkling already so you know luke is fucking badass don't get me wrong uh and he also against all odds look at episode six right he decides no um i'm a jedi like my father before me you know he puts everything down and and accepts death fucking death uh, over joining the Emperor. And that's badass, and Luke's badass, but this, just really think it takes away from the character, personally. But it's an interesting one, you know, just one to have a little thought about. It's pretty good, it's all right. Stan Lee is a watcher. So this one's pretty simple. Basically, what happened was, because Stan Lee was in so many films, this is at least how I interpreted this information, the, this uh, course of events, this series of events, right? Stan Lee is in so many Marvel films. Fans go, holy shit, maybe he's a watcher like in the comics. You know, the, the basically watchers are people who watch the universe, the multiverse, uh, and just make sure everything's going uh, to plan. You know, everything's all right, basically, right? Uh, James Gunn saw that, made him like a correspondent in Guardians of the Galaxy 2 when he shows up with the Watchers. Um, and people think because he, because of that theory, he's a Watcher. When really he's just like basically, he's basically like a uh, liaison or, or something similar to that. So he's more of an informant than an actual Watcher. Uh, but it's still an interesting one. Uh, to think about because it's almost a paradox because the reason like um, people think he's a watcher and I'm not sure maybe perhaps this was made this uh, iceberg was made uh, iceberg chart was made uh, before Guns of the Galaxy 2 came out but uh, it's an interesting like paradox you know because you know James Gunn put it in so that people could be like oh that's really cool and because people said he was a watcher but now people really think he's a watcher 
or did when Guardians of the Galaxy 2 came out, like before he uh, said himself, listen, he's like an informant, you know, and I based, based the theory on that. It's quite complicated, but it's it's like, it's yeah. I don't know, it's pretty cool. Uh, he's not a watcher, he's an informant, but either way, we both know, all of us know that the man himself fucking deserves as many cameos as he got and more. I think he was in Across the Spider-Verse, wasn't he? Which is amazing. And he's just a fucking legend. Rest in peace to him. Pretty, yeah, it's alright one. It's okay. <laughs> the real world in the Matrix is still fake. A great explanation of this theory by, I think, Eskig is his name on Reddit, speculates that because Zion, which is like Earth, uh, has been destroyed so many times, it wouldn't make sense for it to actually be Earth, and that it's another uh, matrix simulation basically uh this is an interesting one i'm not too like privy to the uh the matrix lore um so i can't get into the minutia of this but i i always love things like this and theories like this that really test our uh thought patterns and and uh our ability to have existentialist questions thrown at us like this whether it be from people we know the internet you know people on the internet anyone you meet or just by yourself you know and uh i really appreciate that i always appreciate those uh those questions i always appreciate those thoughts and ideas so this is a really good one because of that so yeah perhaps you know it's like it's like with lots of other films spoilers for inception like inception you know what I mean? The the ending for Inception. And that will actually, I think, there's another theory in here that comes up later. Um, that's similar. It goes goes into the vein of this, the these existential um, theories about uh, about films that, that sort of link to whether the, the film's reality is real within itself. Um, but yeah, really interesting one. I think that it's very plausible as well and perhaps like the reason he mentioned it in the uh, basically the architect mentioned that there was destroyed so many times zion and perhaps that was mentioned in the script and in the film because it's an admittance that even zion the real world isn't real i mean it's better that way you know what i mean no one wants to fucking be living in a human farm fucking reality where the sky's gone and like everyone's in big pods and shit uh, i know that's kind of the reality we live in but with animals because we fuck over animals so much but so we need to work on that too but um we get what we deserve i guess you know um so in a way i kind of hope it is in reality um but yeah this is an interesting one i just, i like to believe this one's true wally is evil who doesn't love a bit of Wally? You know what I mean? Um, it's a great film, wholesome, really well made, really well written uh, Disney film. And who doesn't love a bit of it? Is, it? is it Disney Pixar? But what if all those ho wholesome things, right? That that perspective. What if it's what if we're actually wrong about it? What if we're not actually taking the right perspective and it's it's the film that's that's guiding us to take that perspective when really we shouldn't be so someone actually on reddit again um compared to this story and characters of uh, vexelius is the guy who poses this this these comparisons and, and this uh this basically the whole theory compares the story and characters of wally to adam and eve and the bible essentially uh, obviously the name eve who is one of the characters in wally is a good you know dead giveaway there um and maybe maybe i just came out just thought about this what if wally his name actually means wait a b c d i was gonna say it means f wall e fourth wall it means f the fourth wall but it's E is uh, five, isn't it? So maybe that's, maybe that's, I'm just going full fan theory mode now. 
maybe he represents fourth wall maybe he represents humanity maybe he represents the whole film breaking the fourth wall it's the fifth wall we're in now so it's e wall e wall e five walls five fifth wall <laughs> um perhaps maybe i mean it's a weird name but and you know going back to the, the theory he says or gives speculates uh it gives us the idea that basically wally is satan and uh eve is eve basically the robot eve is eve and basically given that the humans are in paradise i mean they're like sucking down smoothies and shit they're like fucking vibing you know they don't have to fucking get up uh they're there's no like war pol political bullshit going on they're in paradise and because of that it's like the bible in which i've not read the bible i'm not religious so i'm not again privy to to that much like the matrix and you could say the matrix is like the modern bible it's a religion guys i mean come on what, what are you doing it's obvious the matrix is a religion no, but um because of that and because Wally comes in and basically fucks that all up by introducing the seedling and basically introducing the new life that uh, can be grown now on Earth, he's like Satan. And he's basically introducing to this paradise a way to strand them back on Earth. And really, Wally is evil. So that's a really interesting one to, to flip the whole film, right? Because if you think about it, they are technically content. I mean, they're not healthy, but they're technically content. They're getting all the nutrients they, they need. And so that really pits uh, Wally against humanity. And he's almost the anti-humanity um, because of that. And it makes him seem quite arrogant that he's basically putting all his ethics and ideas of, oh, I'm going to get the seedling and you have to do, you have to rebuild society now because I say so. It makes him a little prick in that perspective right it makes him a little little um arrogant asshole that he's like pushing his ethics um and it's just you know it's crazy it's crazy when you think of it that way uh or he isn't or this isn't true but it is really interesting and obviously the the eve connection there really runs deep uh, and it, it's such a simple plot that it makes sense. Uh, all these all these parallels to the Bible make sense. So it's fascinating, really interesting. Wally well, is Satan. But yeah, I remember the Xbox 360 Wally game. Fucking banger. It was like the Dark Side of the Moon game where I played the demo. I don't know if I actually played the, the demo of the uh, Dark Side of the Moon game, but I played the Wally demo, and it was sort of in between, the in the middle of the game, I think. And I fucking played the shit out of that demo because I loved the game. I never got the game. I just never wound up getting it. Um, but yeah, absolute fucking banger. Same with Dark Side of the Moon. Fucking wanted that game. Got it on the Nintendo, I think, it wasn't the same game back in the day when you know the nintendo ds games were different than the console games you know yeah it's pretty good stuff blade runner and alien are in the same universe now we're talking all right now we're coming on to my territory or not my territory but closer to or well, once it's only my territory you get what i mean I've got my Blade Runner 2049 poster there, got another one, got another one up there. Um, and I tell you this theory, I've always loved this theory, okay, because it basically puts two of the best films ever fucking made in the same world, uh, and it would really work, okay, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So we all know, you know, Blade Runner had a lot of impact in our society in terms of even the book you know and also the film in terms of really reviving that existentialist idea of what are we as humans you know who are we what does humanity represent what do we mean what does it mean to be human and blade runner is all about that by putting it exactly the the opposite of that if that makes sense by by making the main character perhaps be human and perhaps not be human it really pushes that thought and pushes those ideas through through that character and his motivations and his struggles his anguish um 
Blade Runner's 2049, Blade Runner's 2049 is what really, you know, took, took me, slammed me down one of those fucking, uh, things that you transport people on when they go in the hospital, stretchers, right? It fucking got the defibs out and it fucking shocked my ass, okay? Not my ass, me, right? Into a state of, a pulse of, of love for film and cinema that i'd never felt before same with the batman recently you know absolutely incredible films that are curated and perfectly worked on and are just poured over by people like me and poured over by the artists that made it when they were making it and when they cre created it and the minutia and the details of every single thing and the the union of each uh head department head is just absolutely amazing i mean it's just fantastic cinema right amazing cinema so basically also it's in the same world as soldier blade runner is and to sort of think that both alien and blade runner such amazing cinema uh, are in the same universe is just, it's amazing it's so cool but essentially the reason this theory exists is because in uh alien there's the exact same screen uh, reading, it, it gives a ship name, or a dock name, I think, uh, and another, like, a few screens that are exactly the same, and now you might say, oh, well, that's just production design being reused, uh, you know, Ridley, he's not got a lot of money for these films, that's just production design, uh, you know what I mean, but I like to think that he wouldn't do that, like, without it having a purpose, and it's not a gigantic leap. Both films use similar technology, both films would feasibly, could feasibly live in the same world, because they're so far apart. You know, obviously, Alien takes place in space. A little rhyme in there. Um, so, it's not too much of a leap in terms of, uh, them being in the same world. So I, I'd i like to think they are in the same world. It would make sense. And it's just fucking awesome. And if you think that, then that's fine. But, you know, you're just fucking missing out at the end of the day. Okay? Because it's sick. But one thing that is for certain. Uh, the war that is mentioned in Blade Runner is mentioned in a film called Soldier. Now, in that same film, Snake Plissken is also fucking mentioned now snake plissken is the main character of escape from new york by john carpenter one of my favorite films of all time uh a fucking amazing film love that film to death so this film soldier escape from new york alien and blade runner are potentially all in the same fucking universe a oh, really? <laughs> could you hear the the gulpy sort of stuff that is fucking awesome okay that's fucking sick like, that is so cool um so just to think that all of those films are related and in the same universe is just blows my mind it's just fucking it's just so cool man i just fucking love it um so yeah this one's gonna, always going to be one of my favorites this one's always going to be up there same same with the escape from new york one uh part of it i mean not it's kind of the same theory and in a well it's not really the same theory but uh it's just fucking amazing that that is just so cool et is a jedi so given their love for each other's films uh, the movie brats consisting of spielberg lucas coppola de palma and scorsese what an amazing fucking group by the way that's fucking fascinating it's clear that their films are gonna collide not only in their universe, but their love for each other's films, their love for each other as as artists and as filmmakers. And in E.T., there's actually a Yoda costume. I think E.T. walks past, pardon me, a kid who is uh, in a Yoda costume. Now, what I think, this isn't the main theory, by the way, but what I think is still... I don't think that takes away from this theory and what I think is that that is like people wearing sort of ancient Egyptian costumes, right? And because E.T. goes past 
that kid and that kid's wearing that it's simply merchandise from an old age because obviously a long time ago and far far away uh it was before way 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 before our time and that's like, almost like they found remnants of jedi they found remnants of yoda species and they were like oh this is pretty cool and same way you know merchandise is sold about uh, sold for uh ancient you know the romans just every culture right that is the same thing right and it's like of a of an age gone by you can dress up as this so instead of p potentially people dressing up as you know pharaohs and shit people are like and, and ancient egyptians and romans and uh all these all these uh, ideals these like uh, certain kinds of people they dress up as jedi and they dress up as yoda species and uh i think that's where that that's where that links in whereas the main theory is all the way before in the age of star wars in phantom menace the first Star Wars, well, not the first Star Wars film, but the first Star Wars film chrono chronologically. There is ET species seen in uh, the big place, fucking uh, council, fucking floaty thing place where the Emperor uh, does all his manipulating. You know the the sort of our equivalent of the parliament you know what i mean i can't i don't know what the name is and i thought it would actually be funny or me just trying to improvise around that i thought that'd be a bit of a meme which it is because i'm struggling right now it's kind of fucking funny um you can i mean it's not out of like focus in the corner fucking like this it's a clear view of E.T.'s species. He is in the world. And actually it was a favor that he was returning. I just read uh, breaking news. It's a favor that he was returning to um, to Spielberg. Uh, I suppose for, I think it said maybe something to do with Indiana Jones, but I just think it's amazing. There's actually a video out there of uh, George Lucas showing Steven Spielberg, Spielberg George Lucas showing I can't fucking say Steven Spielberg's name. Uh, there's actually a video out there. That's a fucking meme. Of George showing Steven uh, Spielberg, George Lucas, showing Steven Spielberg the droid design. And it was a fucking meme. Like he's just like, yeah, he's gonna cut these. They're gonna, the Jedi are just gonna, they're gonna cut these things down. Uh, it, it, I highly recommend you check it out. It's fucking hilarious. But I just love this friendship. I love these guys working, you know, together so closely. I love that they challenge each other. And they're just all amazing filmmakers that probably wouldn't be as good as they are if they didn't work together to become better. Uh, well, they probably would have. I mean, they're the fucking best filmmakers in the world. I'd say Scorsese is probably the, like, the most... He's the most consistently good and so well uh, studied director in film ever. Scorsese and he's probably objectively if you were to pick one objectively uh in terms of best director you'd probably pick Scorsese I mean I, I think that is unanimous just for the amount of films that he's made that are absolutely perfect you know but yeah it's always really cool to see these ones and uh maybe maybe that was the favor he was giving back as uh you know having et in star wars after yoda was in et yeah who knows um but really fucking cool love this one bruce campbell is mysteria so the raimi trilogy is you know, legendary we all know that and it's clear they had a direction uh, that they were going to go in after spider-man 3 uh, Spider-Man 4 was well uh, planned out. Uh, it's just that essentially the studio didn't see eye to eye with Raimi, which is often the case, you know. But, you know, at least they got to do three really good films. Uh, but with Spider-Man 4, you know, they even had plans uh, for villains for the script and they went through many revisions that they almost, you know, uh, from the studio uh, almost did uh, and almost went through with it because obviously the studio wasn't happy with how Spider-Man 3 was um, they even actually made a game which there are many YouTube videos of people playing it it's very early in development but it was it was, looks really good 
uh, one of the main things, and one of the things that even Raimi said himself that he wanted to do, was make Bruce Campbell Mysterio. Now, throughout the entire trilogy, we see Bruce Campbell playing different roles, different random citizens and people that uh, Peter comes into contact with he plays that maitre d he plays the in, in spider-man 2 he plays the waiter in spider-man 3 i can't remember if he plays anyone in spider-man 1 but it's clear that something's going on there you know you got this guy who's just popping up in peter parker's life and i suppose it would be a bit more plausible if like you know the guy had the same job or he had the same personality but he's like kind of different with each one i think uh, in spider-man 3 he's like pretending to be a french guy it's a fucking meme as spider-man 3 is uh, all the spider-man films are yeah basically sam raimi confirmed it to be the case and it's sort of like uh way back in tier one uh the merchant is the genie thing where it's like you know the the creator comes straight out and says yeah we were planning to do that but we just didn't end up doing it so yeah really cool it would have been really cool to see mysterio in this in mysterio in this world and to see that payoff because it's one of those uh, really cool setups in a f film series in anything uh, well not in anything but it's just an interesting i guess easter egg in anything one of the best easter eggs in the marvel universe uh, and in his films which is saying a lot considering there are quite a few easter eggs in uh sam raimi's films from what i what i know but yeah uh would have been really cool to see this one it's a shame that uh, spider-man 4 wasn't made uh i hope they're able to make a new spider-man film with sam raimi obviously he did doctor strange and the something what is it again i forgot can't remember the specific name the multiverse doctor strange film and it, that was really good um and they're you know obviously marvel's working with them so uh i think they actually might be working on something i think there was some chatter about it uh and i'd love to see the amazing spider-man 3 you know after spoilers for the amazing spider-man films gwen's death and uh uh peter andrew garfield's peter becoming quite vengeful because you know i love me some vengeful stuff you know the batman of course had to mention my my favorite fi one of my favorite films uh perhaps my favorite film at this point uh in in the episode because i have to mention every episode okay i have to mention it okay good okay i'm happy we, i'm happy we're on the same page but yeah this one's really cool I wish it was the case yeah hope they do something with this Owen Grady is the kid from Jurassic Park 1. So in the very beginning of uh, Jurassic Park 1, the very first Jurassic Park film by obviously none other than Steven Spielberg, one of the movie brats, which we also discussed in one of the last videos, um, is legendary, especially the beginning of the film. It's very Spielberg-esque where, you know, they're in this sand dune-ish environment and it's quite unrelated to the main story and it's sort of setting up uh the characters and seeing up sort of the rest of the film but it's not really related to the film the the events and basically there's a kid who uh dr allen absolutely destroys in the beginning of the original jurassic park and people think that the guy from jurassic world whose name is own grady who's played by chris pratt uh is basically him uh because like he almost like you could say he wanted to like uh, he was so intrigued in that film that he wanted to become, you know, like Dr. Allen and did so and, you know, worked with uh, dinosaurs and everything more. But yeah, I think they actually disproved this. And I'm not sure if there is actually an origin sort of story because I've not seen Jurassic World, any of those films. It's interesting to think like that he would start this path. Uh, just to disprove Dr. Allen and almost to to get him back you know again going back to Kevin McAllister as Jigsaw which I watched Saw last night it was really good it was really interesting to make that connection when watching it because it's really interesting to see how people could change and could become something different in the subconscious between the films and between the gaps and investigating those little bits in between but yeah this will just be in everyone's head canon i'm pretty sure it's not true i think i saw something where the i don't have anything here uh reporting live on uh, my my co-hosts have not uh, have you, you've not given me the all the information uh you're fired uh you're never gonna work in this town again um anyway i'm pretty sure it's not true but 
would have been dope would have been really cool <sighs> you know we can dream blank is a scroll so because of the inclusion of the scroll in the mcu which uh was jump started i think in far from home and spoilers nick fury being a scroll in um those films or like the the subsequent films or previous films uh it's really interesting because you know i i personally think it's quite like frustrating because there's no real hint and setup and it just feels quite cheap at least in terms of the mcu not in terms of spider-man because i don't think they really chose to reveal that they didn't you know john watson choose to like you know reveal that part of his character which i think it was revealed in that film but it just felt yeah it just didn't feel right but essentially this says this theory poses the idea that um happy hogan maria hill uh sharon carter and all these other people could be scrolls and you know with like sharon carter for example kind of happy hogan like happy kind of is quite different uh like he acts very different but i mean like you, you're just throwing away character arcs for like the sake of like oh my god what if he's a scroll it's just like well you know what i mean like just let the guy have a fucking arc let him have a character arc you know um like happy hogan for example is the best example for that people saying he's a scroll it's like you're just taking away and spoilers for no way home the facts that aren't made out you're taking that arc away and that his reaction to that and his character growing and, and you know becoming becoming a bit more likable becoming a bit more gentle and forgiving and just a nicer guy in general uh and a, just a better person you're taking that and also his loss like you know tony stark's loss and his grief for, for that and then subsequently aunt may and his relationship kind of building up with peter a bit you're taking that and you're just squashing it just because oh it'd be cool if he was an alien it sucks right like some of these sharon carter okay fair enough because like she was like kind of uh chill with captain america i think wasn't she in uh, civil war and everything i think it was the war um again the reason i keep you know saying oh i think it's this thing as that is because i'm not an mcu buff uh i have watched them and some of them are absolutely amazing uh well, i wouldn't say absolutely amazing actually eh, yeah they're pretty they're really good it's kind of like the harness force sensitive one where it's just like oh this would be cool but also the majority are just like um uh, no this is just gonna fucking swallow just because you think it's kind of cool peter parker is in iron man 2 so during the climactic fight in iron man 2 we sort of see a kid uh, amongst the chaos amongst the fight just sort of reacting to what's going on and quite shocked and sort of frozen for a minute it's quite shocked and, and frozen just in time for a minute just out of you know shock uh and given the fact that uh, peter parker is such a big fan of tony stark and since he probably would have been around that age uh in the timeline of iron man 2 timeline it would make sense that that was peter parker all along and you know since he's a big fan uh, it would make sense why he is uh as far as i'm concerned i think this is really cool i'm not a big fan of the iron man spider-man relationships in the films because i think it takes away from peter a bit but it also makes sense given the fact that you know he's missing not only parents but also any sort of father figure since you know I don't know when uh uncle i don't know when his uncle dies but yeah and his parents yeah uh it's really cool that this could have been in there and could have actually been because the thing with the mcu and it's fallen off uh sort of after endgame um and a bit before with some things like i said with the scrolls is that they're really good at setting up things and uh knowing uh what they're going to do in the future to then go ha 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 we had it he was there all along and everyone's like oh <laughs> see what you did there oh ooh. that was uh clever yeah no it wasn't it uh yeah it wasn't it yeah we, we knew we know what we know what we're doing we knew what we're doing oh clever aren't you uh <laughs> yeah cool and just you know i don't know why marvel just doesn't come out and say yeah, yeah this this is this is canon 
because it's like there's literally nothing to disprove it and his face is covered we can't hear him uh you know if he has like an if he were to have like a boston accent or something or like a silly accent from like like a well not silly accent but just a completely different accent we can't hear him and we can't see him so like there's no way to disprove his identity and that so just come on marvel just say oh yeah he he was peter Parker. you might as well rick deckard is a replicant the themes of both blade runner the major themes of both Blade Runner films is that of what it means to be human and subsequently identity. Who are we? What do we represent? What does being human represent? Right? Therefore, this theory is very, very valid and isn't really even a theory. It's almost like a part of the Blade Runner experience. Wondering, you know, is Rick Deckard actually a replicant? The facts are there and the questions uh, are really, really quite valid. The theory is quite valid. There are just so many points that would point, there are just so many points that would make this more clear and actually be valid. For example, obviously his co-worker. God, I can't do anything, can I? For example, Gaff knowing when major life events happens to Rick Deckard is very, very weird, almost like he has been there and knows exactly how it goes because he's a replicant you could put this down to him just being wise but him knowing exactly when those things happen and putting the origami there and basically almost nudging it's like almost nudging rick decker to go i'm gonna do it's gonna try to do harrison ford you guys know how that goes uh but we're, we're gonna go for it maybe i maybe i'm a replicant now Maybe I'm a replicant. Um, you gotta you sort of move the mouth up a bit. That is a trick, all right, everybody. So I don't want to hear any, you know. And I think he's older as well. He looks older, Gaff. Uh, so that would make sense that he would know he's a replicant because obviously he would have been there when he was created by Tyrell. Um, so it would make a lot of sense. I think Ty is Tyrell the one in the original Blade Runner or is that the one in Blade Runner 2049? I haven't seen either of them in a while, which is a shame because Blade Runner 2049 is probably my favorite film of all time. The comment about all of this was by Vicken1976 on Reddit. Uh, however, the original poster of the thread, uh, The Walking Thread, poses some arguments against this. One of them being that Deckard isn't nearly as strong as the other replicants. If you look at the end fight, the main replicant he's fighting, played by Rutger Hauer, absolute legend, rest in peace to him, uh, he's actually so strong, compared, especially compared to Deckard, that obviously he's ripping through walls, he's like breaking through, you know, anything he can get his hands on. And obviously, could have easily killed Deckard. Uh, I mean, his only the only reason he didn't is because of his choice to to sort of spare him out of realizing almost how precious life is. I think so because of that, you know, it wouldn't make sense that he's a replicant because he would have a lot of strength, and he'd be able to easily fight Rutger Hauer. Uh, his character, I keep forgetting his character name, but um, that's one of them. Uh, there's also the fact that he was retired at the beginning of the film, even though uh, obviously replicants never get tired um perhaps perhaps he was retired because he was sick of the job he was sick of living like that which would line up with his character so i don't think that one's as strong as like you know the first one or the next one also there's obviously the the idea you know that he lives longer which he does obviously replicants have a, a much shorter lifespan but Deckard has clearly lived longer. And I think it kind of goes for Gaff as well. I'm not sure how old Gaff is, but Gaff looks pretty old. And, you know, given how young all the replicants look, I mean, they're not, they don't look too young. There's the one that uh, killed that police officer. He didn't look too young, but I'm not sure how, like if they're born looking older, perhaps. So yeah, obviously there are lots of points for and against this, but I think ultimately it's a very, very good theory that really kind of cracks Blade Runner open a bit and really lends itself to the themes of the film and the introspection that comes with watching the film. Ghost sightings. So if you're anything like me, which I'm sure you are because you're watching this, uh, but if you're not, that's completely fine, of course, you are a visual sort of perceptive person analyzing every frame every shot and 
lots of that analysis comes with discovering things that people really haven't either dis discovered themselves or haven't figured out um or they have and have created a theory like this of course which is the numerous ghost sightings uh in films i i'm not completely sure what this uh I'm not completely sure what they mean by ghost sightings, but I'm assuming what they mean is ghost sightings in films, uh, if that makes sense. So like ghost sightings in the background of films that they happen to catch because they were filming it. I'm uh, at least assuming that's what they mean. Well, the Probably the most famous is Three Men and a Baby, where you can see in the background of a shot what looks like a person peering out uh, towards the main actors. T Ted Danson is actually in that scene um which is very haunting and terrifying just because of how still and you know human like it looks but it's very eerie that it happens in this like very out of context scene that's just like a normal scene as well and this like figure is just in the corner watching another one would be uh Wizard of Oz which people say uh has a certain thing in one of the scenes that thing being a basically hanging munchkin uh literally it, which is literally as it sounds a munchkin hanging himself on the set of the scene in the background of one of the shots uh, because of supposedly i think what the theory uh, the the sort of lore behind why this happened was because of how they were being treated on set and the the overwork that they were going through on the set of the wizard of oz this has actually been debunked as to be a bird in the background you can even see parts of its wing and different parts of it and there's a great video that's actually debunks this theory completely there's also the ominous boom operator or ghost in the background of the ring now i'm not trying to fucking fuck with any ghosts here and say oh the boom operator and, the, and then the ghost gets pissed because it's like i'm not a fucking boom operator and haunts me I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry, ghost. I don't want to fuck with anyone here. I'm just saying, that's what it looks like. That's all I'm saying. Um, and I'm being serious. I don't want to fuck with any ghosts, man. But it does suspiciously look like a cast or crew member. And we all know... <sighs> we got the script suit behind the fucking... You know, everyone has to be on set for some reason. Get off the set, you know. Why is the third AD's mother... Uh, you know what I mean? Get off the set. We don't need you here. I, I, and you know what annoys me is like non the, the fact that non crucial crew members still like to hang about annoys me. And I'm not trying to have a go at you guys, but you know, you're not fucking needed to be in like anywhere near the set right now. You know what I mean? It annoys me. It annoys me. And it also puts pressure on the crew, but and the cast. Yeah, I suspect that's simply just a boom up. Another very haunting thing is the Poltergeist production. After the production ended, I think a week after, a few weeks after, one of the cast members was unfortunately killed or died. Um, some people think that's because of the production and that the production was haunted and that it's a bit of a situation where, you know, because you're making this movie about a poltergeist, a real life poltergeist that perhaps you know was it was based on because i think the the film is actually based on a real real events that they obviously killed one of the main cast members it's uh, either way it's absolutely awful and i can't imagine how the parents feel and just how much was lost and taken from that kid's life it's absolutely fucking awful and obviously i think with theories like this you really need to be careful what you're talking about you need to be respectful uh, which I think, like, you know, some people might not be. Um, I think either way, it's awful, you know, that a kid had to be, his, had his life taken. But yeah, that is also one theory that because he was part of the production, he died. I, again, I don't think that has anything to do with it. I think it takes away from the real person's death uh, in uh, at all. And I think it's quite, to, to question a death like that is pretty fucked up. A real death as well, not a character's death. So... It's, it's things like that. And also, you know, you hear of, if, if we're talking about ghost sightings, also productions themselves, since we're talking about poltergeist, people claim, again, I don't believe in that. I take, think it takes away from the, the family and the real death. Um, productions being haunted, such as Don Quixote. Now, Terry Gilliam tried to make this film many times. 
uh, his, he had to go through main cast members, he had to go through storms, mudslides and stuff like that, I think as well. Um, and they had to call Force Majeure on it and end the production, which Force Majeure is basically a big force that stops production. And it's even sort of a legal thing and a thing that producers know of and are aware of and implement. So it's not just a write-off or a thing that, you know, someone can say um, and has no precedent. It has precedent and it's, it's there just to cover people because sometimes it's just ridiculous how much is stopping uh, this production from taking place, which is what happened on Don Quixote. Luckily, he eventually made it and they made it with Adam Driver and what's that guy's name? Can't remember his name. The guy from, oh, come to think of it, he was actually already in a Terry Gillen film. He was in Brazil and he was in The Two Popes, that guy. But yeah, it's absolutely crazy the amount of force that can go behind stopping something, especially a film production. And it really makes you think about reality and what things might be in your way of creating what you want and the coincidences that are affiliated with those, you know? Rest in peace to that kid though. And uh, yeah, it's just some really eerie stuff that really makes you think about life and just makes you think about a lot of things. DCEU Joker is Jason Todd. Oh, baby. Oh, yo, yo, mama. <laughs> oh, my God. Zooey mama, this is what I want to hear. Okay, this is my shit. Here, boys. You got my fucking boy, Jason Todd, and this bitch. You got my motherfucking boy, Joker, and this bitch. Well, he's not my boy because he's fucking evil. But yeah, but I mean, this is what I'm talking about. Now, Take your, take your sort of self back to the release of the original Suicide Squad. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Put yourself in the perspective of us viewers. Um, Batman v Superman, I think, was already out. We knew Robin died. Okay. We knew that there was a massive chance that Jason Todd was that Robin because we all know death in the family okay um we all knew what was going to be revealed perhaps revealed uh in terms of jason todd being in this world it was later debunked okay that it was dick grayson which is pretty annoying you might as well just make it jason todd at that point quite quite frankly or tim drake because having dick grayson killed off is just i i can never recall dick grayson even like um going through something like that and it doesn't I, I just don't like it you know but because of the precedent of that okay in bvs batman v superman seeing robin's uh decayed uh, well maybe perhaps not decayed but robin's uh graffitied and memorialistic suit you know in in the bat cave i think it's in the bat cave isn't it it's in the, or is that part of his manner uh, with ha 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 written on it, I mean, we all are going to think that Jason Todd and the Joker had a little death in the family shit going on here, right? Cut to the release of Suicide Squad. Now, Joker. He's a young, he's, he's actually quite young, okay? He's got a J <laughs> on his, uh, on his face, which, yeah, you might go, okay, well, you're an idiot, it's Joker. Yeah, that's why he's got a J in his face. He's got damaged on his forehead, as in, you know, maybe damaged by a crowbar <laughs> that has beaten you to death. That would cause, that would cause a bit of damage, okay? Um, and again, he's quite young. And obviously the precedent of Jason Todd perhaps dying and being in this universe. What did we think? Rightfully so, we thought, well, there's no Red Hood here. There's no Robin here that's being revived. There's no Nightwing. There's no Red Robin. There's nothing going on here, right? So what do we think? That the Joker is Jason Todd. Okay. Now, there were those massive pieces of evidence there that really outlined the theory and really had everyone thinking and got everyone hyped up. But no, 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 he's not. It's just the Joker. And also, it would make a lot of sense in terms of the missing teeth and the grill. I know, obviously, it was supposed to be that the Joker was beaten to hell by Batman, and that's how he lost, like, after he killed 
what we thought was Jason Todd was, was Dick Grayson. Um, but no, it's just that it was Dick Grayson that died. Which, you know, I'd like to have a bit of death in the family in my live action universe Batmans. So that's amazing. I mean, it's amazing to see that we have anything like that. But it was a bit of a disappointment. But another thing that's also evidence to, to suggests it is that in the Snyder Cut of Justice League, uh, there's a scene where Joker is a part of the remaining League. Uh, or, well, perhaps, you know, they wouldn't want to call him part of the League, but they're working with him, with Joker, and says to Batman when they're talking about Dick Grayson, or what we thought was Jason Todd back in the day, his death, his death, said, you sent a boy to do a man's job. Now, you know, you could ever analyze that and saying, well, he's talking about himself being Jason Todd uh, or being a being a Robin, saying that basically he was reborn into a man and he knows what that was like. But it also wouldn't make sense why he would say that, because you'd think he would address the previous Joker because there would have to be some Joker that killed uh, Jason Todd, right? Or Dick. So, so then you ask yourself, well, what if Dick is joker but no probably not i mean it's much more likely that it's jason todd and i think we all know it's the you know not a thing Zack snyder's not said anything about it i think he's debunked it as well but i really like the idea that instead of becoming red hood uh jason todd becomes joker and becomes the thing that killed him and it's almost like a therapeutic cathartic thing in a sense and beca becoming this new version of the joker and i think it worked really well in that universe because it doesn't feel like a an original or not original but it doesn't feel like a first joker just because of how young he is and how different he is you know like that joker would have to be i want to say 10 years younger than ben affleck's joker ben affleck's joker ben affleck's batman which would mean that he wouldn't really he would be way too young to be the joker you know uh when at the beginning of batman's career which we all know he probably was a part of he was probably in that part of the timeline um so that doesn't make any sense and it would make sense why he's that he's the second joker and he would be about around you know he could feasibly be around the age of a robin another thing as well is what if the suicide squad flashbacks uh, obviously you see joker's dressed entirely differently there's the one that is based on the harley quinn comic i think it's batman harley quinn i think it's called or something like that where it's that alex i think alex ross does the cover the sort of tuxedo like uh design clothing and harley's wearing the checkered batman animated series sort of clothing as well that could be the first joker and that's why he looks so different is because it's a different person right i mean he does look entirely different obviously his bone structure how he looks as a human being he looks like the same person but i don't know but there, there could probably be a reason for that but yeah i i'll always love this theory I always think about this one it's classic it's a fucking legendary one and we love it we love it here on the chan on the channel us is about class division so we all know, you know, John Peel, he's got lots of films under his belt at this point. Lots of really good films. Get Out was an absolute hit. I didn't like Us as much. I haven't watched Nope, but that looks really good. That looks like um, it would be on the level of Get, get Out. But we all know that he's a he's an amazing, terrific, you know, I've not used the word terrific in a while, uh, horror filmmaker. And not only that, his layered themes, for example, in Get Out about racial superiority about racism about this almost hypocritical racism of you know idolizing black people in and and sort of seeing them as these superior beings that they can breed and create another race in order to use them you know uh in in get out and obviously the hypnosis is the way to get there to sort of build this army but how is this reflected in us well the doppelgangers or the tethered as they're called are almost a representation of the lower class and that they're a lower class reflection of the people main characters family in the film right and that we're peel actually said himself our own worst enemies you know that we can't push ourselves higher to become better we just detriment ourselves 
and self-sabotage that keeps us I suppose in this class system which also plays in our mind as well I think is the thing you know w even if we're against the class system it's society still pushes it and and puts these uh, self-sabotaging self-loathing fucking thoughts in your fucking mind that just play at you right and i think us is a great reflection of that i'm personally not a big fan of just how the film is in terms of structure in terms of just how it's presented uh, the mise-en-scene is great but the way that it's overall written i think is like the main reason i don't love it a lot and really really appreciate it but i also do appreciate the layered nature of it and i just think jordan peele he's a fucking master of doing that sort of horror and i'm really excited to see nope actually but it's it's clear that this is true and the film is about that because peel himself says that and we already know that he's got a reputation to have those kind of layered commentaries in this film so yeah it's great the tarantino universe Given the love for Tarantino's films, it's not surprising people want to dive deeper into them, analyzing every aspect of them, specifically the mentions of other characters or other films in the universe. By that, I mean in Pulp Fiction with Mia Wallace, obviously talking about her role in this other film where she is basically playing the bride from Kill Bill. I mean, it's literally the exact same story and the exact same characters, as well as obviously Vince Vega being related to Mr. Blonde, whose real name is Victor Vega. Those little nods and uh, ties to other things in his universe really come together when you, you look at the entire perspective and watch all his films and uh, really analyze those things and think about, well, you know, how are these things related? One main thing is that it's, it gets complicated in terms of which films actually are films or productions in the world of that film and which characters are in that world. So, for example, like, there are two layers. It's actually proved to be true. Uh, he gave details about it in 2017, I think, in an interview. And he gave very specific details about how those layered uh, different world universes collide or come into contact with each other I suppose you could say so there's there are two universes there is the realer than realer world which is basically the main world or mo the world that most of the films take place right so that's your you know that's Reservoir Dogs True Romance Pulp Fiction Death Proof Inglorious Bastards Django Unchained and the hateful eight and then there's the movie universe which which in the realer than real universe are films if that makes sense it's, it kind of gets it's hard to like actually explain it for example may wallace talking about her role as a as i just discussed in kill bill anyway this is really cool um and it's really cool that he acknowledged it very cool Dorothy is the Wicked Witch of the East. We've obviously already gotten into some Wizard of Oz stuff with the Hanging Munchkin theory, but this one is more plot related. Because Glinda the Good Witch of the North doesn't actually identify the witch that was crushed, it posits that maybe Dorothy is the Wicked Witch of the East. And it really, this one really makes you think about, it's a lot like the Wally's evil um, theory where it makes you think about a t completely twist 180s every motive that uh, Dorothy has and why she's doing what she's doing. Perhaps she is a witch and that she doesn't know it. Perhaps she does know she's a witch. You know, there are lots of things there that make you think, well, you know, why is she doing what she's doing? The intentions behind her actions. It would make sense perhaps why she wants to go to see Oz himself. Perhaps she wants to kill him. Perhaps, you know, there are many, many reasons why she could be doing what she's doing. Maybe she wants to round all these good people up to turn them into soldiers for the little monkey army. You know, those flying monkey fucking things? Those things are fucking crazy, man. They're creepy. They're creepy. Like, imagine... That's mental. Um, but, yeah, it's a really good one. Again, like the Wally is evil theory. And, you know, maybe... We've, it's actually come to think of there are lots of different things to do with the Wizard of Oz. Maybe they're all connected. For example, the Hanging Munchkin uh, one. Maybe she, Dorothy hung 
one of the munchkins not in real life obviously but in the film and the dark side of the moon sinking is actually hints to the the eeriness i mean because it is very eerie in the production of the wizard of oz if you watch uh videos on that i'm gonna watch a video again about it the, you know they had asbestos was the snow you know people were very mistreated uh the girl who plays dorothy she was exploited a lot and there's just a lot going on there and it's just a very eerie uncanny and i think very liminal you know i think lots of people point to that being the first liminal film you know liminal space back rooms sort of experience film piece of media i suppose where it's it's supposed to be all this this oh everything's great but there's just something that's very very strange about it and it just puts you off and i think that's down to a lot a lot down to a big part of that is down to the production and what happened behind the scenes but you could definitely put all those together and um you know obviously you don't you, it's you don't want to be insensitive about the hanging munchkin because that was a theory about a real uh person and i hope no one was hurt but uh if you put them all together in the plot of the film it, you you could put something together there and it could be really interesting like i said um but yeah it could all be really about this eerie the the blurred line between good and evil and that's what uh chat gpt actually prompted me to to think about with uh, what it what it wrote there you know the the real motives there and the real side of good and evil in the films or in that film particularly obviously they made a prequel but yeah john mason is an older james bond so in this film called the rock which sean connery is in he has a lot of really efficient combat skills and he's very similar to james bond with his skill set therefore people think that it is actually in the same world as james the james bond films 007 films and that he's actually his character in that film is actually an older james bond because obviously you know the the coincidences are are crazy there i always love continuations like this like uh the malcolm in the middle theory that you know malcolm in the middle which i hope we were able to do some tv show fan the theory iceberg explained uh videos and a series and i'm able to find a good iceberg to do it on or perhaps create my own we'll see um that theory that basically malcolm in the middle takes place after breaking bad the theory is that it's often there's even a skit about it which is really funny i really love things like that you know that a entirely different character could be actually be branched off from another um it's it's fascinating to think about and it's really interesting to th think about the coincidences there and also you know if the filmmakers had that in mind um, which i'm sure most of the time 99 percent of the time they didn't but yeah, this one definitely is good for all those all the peeps that love James Bond. Finding Nemo is about the five stages of grief. Obviously, Marlon goes through a lot in this film, and it's hard to believe because of the loss uh, of Nemo that perhaps you know a lot of these things aren't real. Grief uh, is a horrible thing um, that eats you up inside and creates these almost delusions or even you know false holds on reality that you think you know the person's still alive and i you know, i'm gonna start to tear up but it's just awful the the feelings that it can induce and the fake realities that it could put you through the hallucinatory realities and it makes you really after having that perspective or knowledge or education about grief think that this film is only about that but actually you know perhaps when all of his family members are killed Nemo actually died as well and that Nemo actually was never there throughout the entire film and he's imagining him and his journey to return Nemo is you know hallucinatory denial anger bargaining depression and acceptance draw parallels within this film to the characters that they go by and the the things that they face the obstacles that they face it obviously gives you a completely crazy perspective when you think of it that way it makes you think of it as a new layered piece and that's really good it's never bad it's never a bad thing because i personally don't really like finding nemo i remember i watched it i think i watched it in class uh, a while back and it just felt very repetitive repetitive and that 
could change that and it could change the narrative into something completely different in a good way so i think i really do think it's a it's about that and i think what they mean is only about that right the the reality isn't real what we're seeing isn't real and it's an untrustworthy narrator i can't think of the the phrase now um specific phrase of that but yeah i think it's definitely already about grief but i think in terms of the reality we're in i don't think it's real and i think uh marlon is going through something that perhaps is hallucinatory and is fake uh and this is quite similar to the matrix theory we covered in uh, i think tier two part one Cobb's wedding ring is his totem so we all know that the totem is very important in the world of Inception. Every character needs it to know if what they're living through is real. It's their tether to reality. It's their tether to anything that they could ever perceive is real. Uh, obviously, we get the implication that uh, the Cobb's totem is the spinning top. And I don't even think that his totem being the spinning top is ever actually completely verified or said in the film. I might be wrong, uh, but I have seen Inception a lot of times, uh, many times. Um, and it would actually be such a Nolan thing to do, especially given the fact that he kind of loves to set things up, but also not completely uh, uh, expose them as twists. He almost adds these twists that are like, oh, it makes you think. But the other things that are very subtle or the other things in the background are the most important, actually. And because he loves Kubrick, as I'm sure lots of people know, Nolan loving Kubrick, it could make a lot of sense why those things are actually highlighted more and more important in the narrative. But people don't know. So this one's really, really good. And I think it'd be really interesting to go through because he frequently wears it and doesn't wear it in the film and to people basically think that when he's wearing the ring he's in the dream and then when he's not wearing the ring he's in reality obviously because then he knows that um he's in the dream but i suppose the about the only thing that doesn't make any sense is i feel a spinning top is a lot more realistic and a lot more a lot it's a lot easier to know if you're in real life or not with that because of the physics behind it whereas the specific you know chinks in the wedding ring or the specific characteristics to it uh would be a bit more subtle and harder to distinguish yeah this is a really cool one love inception uh it's absolutely amazing and it would really give credence to and give uh, a bigger meaning better bigger perspective to his other films like in Tenet you know the the theories that are in that are to do with that film the theories about that film with you know for example Robert Pattinson's my fucking boy fucking legend his character being Cat's son things like that you know this these subtleties that are actually really important it, it would make sense you know and it would actually give those other theories a bit more palpability a bit more validity and it's it's always good to have that always good the briefcase is marcellus wallace's soul so we all know the infamous briefcase in pulp fiction the main thing that every character wants at least in terms of the criminals and the underworld is the briefcase right we all know that it's a valuable thing that characters are willing to die for right it's a very it's a very valuable almost you could even say priceless uh piece so could it be a soul i mean that is priceless it's worth with living or dying for it's worth a lot of money and obviously we don't know what's in it it's not like it's shown to be a feasible thing or it's shown to be a specific thing right and i think you know a soul could be kept in a briefcase the only thing is when they open the briefcase why doesn't it just fly away you know how what is the what are the physics behind it but the gold the gold nature of it the gold light that's that's coming from it also really uh convinces us i think uh, theorists or just viewers in general that it could be a soul also the the telltale sign is marcel's walls has a a sort of band-aid a, a little bandage patch on the back of his neck which i think in the bible or in iconography to do with souls is where the soul is it, it physio physiologically and then it's pulled out of there taken out of there that part of the body so it makes sense that it's there because why else would it be there why else 
like, who nicks themselves there? Who gets hurt there? It's a very specific spot to get hurt. You know, on your arm or your leg or something makes sense. With the back of your neck, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I actually think this is one of the most feasible ones on, on the list because that hasn't been like completely proved again yeah it doesn't make any sense why he would get hurt there it's not like he's gonna be fucking shaving back there you know what i mean and then nicks himself there and also it's quite a smooth part of the body so that wouldn't even really make too much sense it's not like the neck here where it's like a lot of ridges and stuff it's quite a flat part of the body so it just doesn't make sense you know and that really makes me at least believe okay you know there's something going on here yeah really fascinating one man i, I gotta say the deeper it goes the more interesting it guess i think i know that's kind of the point but i just I'm, I'm really enjoying these theories it's fucking good the aliens in signs are demons so i've not seen signs um but m night Shyamalan is a big twist boy a big twisty twisty he's like a big twister you know and he loves his little twisty wissies and for that reason it would make sense why the aliens that are in signs are actually demons i don't think they actually say uh, bluntly if they're aliens and the the creature's aversion to holy water apparently in the film um is apparent and would it would make sense why it's a demon because obviously demons don't like holy water um probably don't like any fucking water they're probably just like fucking mead <laughs> i don't know they're probably like blood that's really what they put they drink or they took a book out of twilight took a page out of... fucking i can't speak took a page out of Also, their malevolence and their evil, their pure evil, their wrath, you know, it would make a lot of sense. So I don't see why they can't be demons. And I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of parallels, at least in science fiction, even though aliens, I'm sure, are probably, you know, just as scared and just as malevolent as us. Yeah, really interesting. And I think it also lends a bit of a, a commentary on how aliens are shown in films, because again, I'm sure they're just as fucking malevolent as us yeah because we're because we're just fucking great aren't we and i just think uh, it's fucking awful what they think uh people people paint aliens to be that way because a uh, being not being of this planet doesn't make it evil instantly and actually i think it's the other way around if you're fucking a human at least human not animals animals are better than humans uh, in every fucking way humans represent consciousness and making wrong decisions while being conscious of them i think that shows the fucking evil as opposed to other aliens that may not even be conscious you know they might have a completely different dimension of consciousness a completely different perception or evolution of consciousness so i think this uh could really lend a commentary to that and really give layer a layer to that uh how they're depicted in films yeah we are the awareness man we got to be more conscious of our thoughts our actions you know Jesus was an engineer in Prometheus. So basically in Prometheus, there are these things called the engineers, which are these tall, pale figures. And because people think as well as the themes of the film being that of destruction and creation, people think that uh, Jesus was an engineer or the other way around uh, and actually, uh, yeah, was one of those creatures. The idea that that's the case, that the engineers were created or influenced human life on Earth is basically central and one of the main parts of the plot of the film so it would actually make sense that he was the creator of human life aka jesus so yeah i've not seen prometheus but this this one's really interesting and uh, you know given the the themes of the film it would make a lot of sense and, and a lot like wally is evil the the mirroring of you know creation of life and these biblical themes it would make a lot of sense so it's definitely very credible you know lots of things you know lots of theories is difficult to say 100 percent if that's what was intended if that's what was meant by it but we know ridley scott is very good at having these layered themes and also his characters and his the people and things that he creates uh meaning more than than that and i think he was he's also actually a fan of kubrick i might be wrong but it's it's interesting how people who are fans of kubrick uh tend to have that more you know have the layers more uh in depth within the film within the films that he creates at least aladdin is in the post-apocalyptic future 
So we can sort of see the dilapidated nature, dilapidated, dilapidated, dilapidated. No, it's got to be dilapidated. It looks very, I don't know how to describe it, apocalyptic. It just looks apocalyptic. Uh, and given the, the sort of quite modern contemporary references that are made, people think that essentially the theory is it's in the post-apocalyptic future, which would make a lot of sense and that's really it in terms of like evidence the isolation and the modern pop culture references is all we really have to to jump off from but obviously that could easily just be well you know i mean robin williams rest in peace um bless him uh that's just him doing his usual riffs and and it is pretty funny to to sort of d to merge this older um time with with modern references you know we saw it in like a knight's tale where they were singing we will rock you stuff like that is quite funny and i just really don't think it has anything to do with the setting of the film but it's one of those that's like not doesn't have much evidence but it's still interesting to think about when you're watching or just think about in general toy story 3 is an allegory for the holocaust now this one, we're starting to get really, really deep here into these really f messed up, fucked up uh, theories that are like, you know, it may, it, they give you a bit of a ooh uh, sort of vibe. Um, and this is for certain one of those. If you go through the entire plot and story of Toy Story 3, you can notice a lot of things that actually, and I'll, I'll link the Reddit post that outlines this exact thing a lot of things that replicate that time period and, and uh, like big events that happened so andy leaves for college which could be the beginning of world war ii right woody and his friends decide to go to the attic like Anne frank they're shipped to sunnyside daycare instead does that sound anything like i don't know a concentration camp and they end up heading straight for an incinerator which we know you know hitler did have things like that that he did have uh these giant basically ovens that he put the poor jewish people in or that it, that can be interpreted interpreted um interpreted as a gas chamber and they're rescued just in time by the green aliens which would be the allied forces they then are given a new home where they're promised safety and stability which would be israel I don't know who's, what perspective that is for, for which country in the war, but I mean, the similarities, the similarities there, and the, there's quite this, it's just this really different vibe to Toy Story 3 that I've always not really noticed, but just, it's so creepy compared to, well, to be fair, like Toy Story, I think it was a Toy Story 2 when there are those, you know, there's the kid that looks like, I think it was his name, Will Poulter from Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and Midsommar. There's that kid that edgy kid who like has mashed together all the toys there's stuff like that that's really creepy uh in the films but they're just it's, uh, it's more like the th things that happen that are creepy in one and two whereas toy story 3 the whole vibe of it is just very uncanny very very uncanny is is how i describe it and i've never really thought about it but this one really makes me think about it now obviously this could easily be just a narrative way to tell a story to have all these quarrels happening and someone's you know put it together and gone oh well it's like world war three so it's like it's about the holocaust um which is definitely the, could be the case and basically is the case because there's no direct evidence but it's an interesting way to write off that eeriness uh, that that toy story 3 evokes the blair witch murder theory I'm just gonna sound like uh, I'm not a filmmaker, film history buff at all, but I haven't seen Blair Witch. Again, I need to see it. I haven't seen Evil Dead 1 or 2 or any of those either. And it's this essential horror film that I haven't consumed and analyzed yet, which is a shame. But um, one, one of the big theories is that basically the two male characters uh were behind the murders and were actually orchestrating the entire thing and when heather i think is the one that actually chooses to to go out and film these events offers for the other two men boys to go with her 
which I think is what happens, uh, they're actually going with her so they can kill her. And they were behind the whole thing. I mean, that would make a lot of sense as well, because who goes, you know, oh, by the way, there's like a bunch of really sketchy shit going on. And uh, it's like got to do with witches and supernatural shit. Who goes, oh, uh, OK, you know, I'm just going to risk my life doing that. And in the woods, by the way, in the woods, not in like, you know, a, a landmark location where you can go out oh, there over by the windmill uh the haunted windmill no it's the woods you can get fucking lost there easily so it wouldn't make a lot of sense um uh, but the only thing about it is that the filmmakers daniel merrick and eduardo sanchez have actually you know confirmed that the supernatural elements are real like they're they are the core of the film right they are actual events that happen they're not these these orchestrated sort of mysterio-esque fucking scarecrow nightmare fucking thing so that basically denotes the whole thing uh which is a shame you know it's kind of a shame when filmmakers do that i'd rather them just not say anything and just leave it up to interpretation quite frankly because it kind of takes away the fun of the analysis of the film especially in terms of story in terms of motiva character motivations that are may may have holes in them not that they do in these films by the way but yeah, it's kind of a shame. Drag Me to Hell represents Christine's eating disorder. So because of the sort of monstrous nature of the antagonism within the realms of this film, people think that the curse, which is that antagonistic force, is a metaphor for an eating disorder. I love when horror films, you know, Midsummer Hereditary, a uh, lot of just there's so many films, even Bo is Afraid more recently, they represent the more horrific sides of humanity rather than the outside world or other things that we can't explain. And our innermost selves and our innermost demons, I think, uh, and disorders and, and troubles and issues with ourselves. Uh, I, I think it's a amazing avenue to push those ideas out there and to also you know expose people to those things like eating disorders which people don't talk about enough and i think with you know shit shot tiktok and shitstagram and uh face twat uh you know all those shitty platforms even youtube's a fucking shit show fuck you youtube you cunts by the way just have to start <laughs> that in there just so, you know it's especially needed and you might say well it was needed in the 50s and the 60s it was too it was too need needed then as well i'm not doubting that but right now with the amount of you know comparisons everyone is making to others bodies and to others lives it's important to highlight those things and i think horror does it really well because it's horror it's so shocking that it really sticks in your mind as opposed to you know mumblecore which i'm not saying it doesn't with lots of mumblecore films and lots of uh you know french new wave films even that some of them are the slower ones i'm not saying that but it just really makes the layman and the casual film goer sort of jump out of their seats a bit more and and, and for makes them makes it stick in their head more i think because of that sh that horrific aspect to it but yeah i think once you dive into it more which i haven't just for time's sake it becomes more apparent and and interesting and obviously i'm more prone to to cover things that i love more and give that more airtime obviously so i apologize for that but this one is still very interesting and i think even just the most base main things associated with the theory and the evidence for the theory just stand out on their own you know sandy is dead in greece another film i haven't seen that's like three in a row i think yeah drag me to hell blair witch sandy is dead yeah there's three in a row but the next one is uh one that i personally added so it's sort of I'm just bouncing out a bit um so basically, this theory says that at the beginning, uh, well, actually, there's two, I think there are actually two scenes or two things, two theories representing this, but I'll just cover this one. Um, at the end of the film, when Sandy and Danny drive into the sky in a flying car, people think that they died, basically. Uh, because of the fantastical nature of it, it's it basically people believe it represents a journey to the afterlife 
which there is another theory that's kind of kind of about that that I actually haven't written into the tiers yet, but it will be in probably the next few tiers. Well, it has to be in the next few tiers, but probably tier five or tier four. Uh, I won't give away what film it is, but I love when uh, people interpret it that way because mortality is a very interesting subject for me. So if you sort of look at that and you analyze the fact that this fantastical journey can represent that as well as the, the sort of physical representation of soaring up into the sky uh, almost up into heaven uh, you, you can really dive deep into to more interpretations of that as well as apparently the lyrics in the song you're the one that I want are analyzed for phrases like you better shape up which some argue could be uh, evidence of purgatory or self-improvement uh, after death or perhaps rebirth i love that word rebirth it's so cool it's based on symbolic interpretations obviously this theory so we all know how easy it is to sort of speculate about symbolic interpretations as opposed to hard facts and evidence but that goes for most things in life to be to be quite honest and it kind of takes the fun away just talking about that and chat chat gpt keeps saying that for because i've got basically evidence and then counter argument it keeps saying that and i'm just like mate you know i get it but just kind of taking the fun out of it kubrick characters are aware they're in a film we've all seen kubrick films and we all know the kubrick stare his inclusion of fourth wall breaking looks at the camera as well as, you know, a lot of narration, for example, Clockwork Orange. Now, this could simply be a technique that Kubrick uses that he's implemented for, you know, either uh, a theory of if that would affect the audience in a certain way or just simply experimenting with his filmmaking and filmmaking style. But it could also mean that characters like jack from the shining which i know we've we we're definitely going to talk a lot about the shining uh throughout this uh iceberg chart just because it's rife with just so many things it's just such a such a layered film and it's so there's so much in there but you, that could be interpreted th that sort of fourth wall breaking looking at the camera i'm looking at the camera right now it's a bit meta uh it it could represent you know, I and I think this works the most with Jack because his spatial warping, for example, uh, of him just being able to completely leave the pantry uh, with no explanation. You might say, "Oh, well, Danny did it. We all know." Blah blah blah, right? And I, I I'm with you, and you know, I, I totally get that. Uh, but the the his spatial warping and his sort of his sort of unbothered nature would make you think that he's some sort of higher being that's aware that he's in a film and also aware that there can be no harm done to him because he's the main character which i would argue he is in the shining uh and also things like uh, it's quite similar with a clockwork orange in a clockwork orange you know alex does all this horrible stuff and he even fights a rival gang but they just don't care they're just like fucking about they're singing in the bath singing in the rain they're like doing what they want to people which is absolutely horrible and even in jail he doesn't really give a fuck like there's just not much emotion or reflection or you know um fear within these characters and that just could be the way kubrick writes his characters and a reflection of the human condition or a metaphor for you know uh, these kinds of people or meaning or so just something anything else studies that maybe he's done but it's interesting to think that perhaps it's because they know uh that they're in a film and again the narration in a clockwork orange that could easily that could basically be him telling like the audience this is like that represents another plane of existence where he can basically reach out to his own film that he's in and narrate it if that makes sense uh without kubrick's like consent you know what i mean like deadpool basically you know stuff like that so when you watch a kubrick film think about that but obviously 
it could easily be Kubrick just sort of trolling us because he likes to fuck with people and he likes to fuck with the audience and he likes to really unsettle them and that just could simply be especially in The Shining the 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 stares that are completely uh unexplained within the the guise of the film it could simply just be a method and it could simply just be there just to fucking creep us out uh, which is probably the case but we all know how you know in depth everything and how meaningful everything is within a coup lightsabers have edges this right so i watched this really interesting youtube short the other day by dread pirate dad 9119 on youtube that basically suggests that we've been looking at lightsabers in the wrong way instead of looking at them as things that can be set as weaker blades or can be set to a weaker setting uh that you can use for training purposes we're actually that's actually completely incorrect and that uh, lightsabers have edges as in you know for example if this was a blade this is the sharp edge this is the blunt edge and then this these two are just completely blunt as well uh but i think it's more likely that there are two sharp edges and then these edges are blunt now this would make a lot of sense for you know there are lots of scenes where luke his lightsaber is basically bouncing off people and not being able to cut through them uh which it would make sense why that's the case and why he's not just you know slicing through people like butter right because he's not used to using a lightsaber and he's not 100 percent sure now this could be uh well, you know this could be a uh, well his kyber crystal was this warped crystal which uh i think the only way to create a kyber crystal is using sith ways um and sith force meditations or something so it could be an unstable crystal and that's why you know it's like that because basically it's unstable and the blade is it doesn't know what to do you know what i mean it's, it's completely unstable blade so parts of it aren't uh consistent so like one part of the blade may be really blunt one might not be and you know like this part of the blade is like really shit and just unstable and then this part is really sharp just because of the crystal but the thing is this is the same with with uh in episode four and you could also say oh well you know it's an old crystal uh because it's anakin's lightsaber but the thing is lots of uh but the thing is lots of jedi have older crystals right uh, and lots of people have lots of jedi have and even said have used their lightsaber for a while and subsequently used that crystal for a while so that can't really explain it too too well especially with qui-gon you know he's pretty old and his no offense to Liam Neeson I'm not saying you're old mate that he he must be must have used that for many many years uh and obviously he's worked with with uh his yoda's basically his master so that that could put him even further back if he's his master so that doesn't really make sense right so basically what this guy says dread pirate's dad is again like i said there are two edges and it would actually pardon me it would actually make a lot of sense as well in terms of cross guards now you might think why the fuck would you have cross guards because in the end at the end of the day you know you're clashing with someone and you're doing that sort of really like up close thing at the end of the day if someone's pushing a lightsaber at you the cross guards the cross guards like that right that's just gonna cut your fa face off right face off that's a good film um uh and you're right you're completely right but what if the the guards are actually there to show you which sides are the edges which sides are the sides that cut right instead of just bounced off things so uh, that was actually that was me that came up with that little bit oh um, no but uh so that sort of adds on to it and makes more sense why there would be cross guards because i think they're more of a hazard and they don't do anything they don't really do anything cross guards it might be easier to perhaps clash with other you know lightsabers and duel because if they strike they go for your hands and try to get your lightsaber and cut it into pieces it could bounce off the the two blades or just not hit the the lightsaber um so that could be the case 
but I really don't think that that's the case, to be quite honest. And I think that that's just an indicator. And you see lots of arrows on lightsabers as well. If you look at like hilts, lightsaber hilts, you can see lots of different, you know, there's like an arrow here, an arrow here. There's lots of sort of triangles and stuff. And that could also indicate, that could just indicate which part is which and where to put things and where to, where to you know, uh, where the buttons are for the lightsaber or where the settings are even. But it could also indicate where the blade edge is. So yeah, this makes a lot of sense and really covers up a lot of issues with that being the case because there's no way in this, and Dread Pirate's dad also said this in the video, there's no way Luke is gonna be fucking fighting uh, Darth Vader on a low setting. And the thing is he would know how to put it in a low setting because he's trained with Obi-Wan, right? And I, cause I was just thinking, well, maybe he doesn't know it's on a low setting or how to adjust it, but he must've put it on a low setting because obviously Obi-Wan was training him and there's no way that he's gonna be swinging a full setting lightsaber around the Millennium, Millennium Falcon, especially during that training bro probe scene. Um, so I, I honestly don't think I have any counter arguments for this because it doesn't really make much sense why he it would his lightsaber would just be bouncing about and that he would be on a lower setting and consistently with two dis different lightsabers as well uh so yeah this one is amazing i really love this one frozen was made to hide walt's frozen head search results so we all know walt disney there's a theory at least that he's frozen in carbonite <laughs> he's frozen uh to preserve his body he's in cryo sleep I think is what you'd call it um so that you know they can give him a little nudge and a cup of tea to wake him up in 100 years and give him a new lung <laughs> um that could revive him uh because you know we just need more anti-semites in the world man you know walt disney we just need him for all you know we can't have we won't have enough anti-semites in the world in that point you know we would have moved past racism and we just need it it's, we're desperate for it. We, we, we're going to be desperate for it. So we just need him and capitalist cunts as well. <laughs> um, uh, and no, I'm not suicidal. If fucking someone kills me for slagging off Walt Disney. I don't have suicidal th thoughts. I'm completely healthy, just so everyone knows. I doubt they'd go out of their way just for me to slag some capitalist cunt off. Um, especially given, you know, it doesn't really, it's not like anything's going to happen by me slagging him off a bit. But people basically believe people. You know, I hear I said that. People basically believe that because I, I don't know why they'd want to cover this up. Come to think of it, because of the, I suppose, private nature of Walt Disney. Maybe they wanted to hide up those search results and therefore made Frozen. Uh, because obviously, if you put in Walt Disney Frozen, it's going to come up with that. But why would so they could people still could look up walt disney's frozen head or cry, walt disney cryogenically frozen and it would still come up with that you just have to be a bit more specific so i don't know this one just seems very stupid um even if he is cryogenically frozen i don't see why like why is that such a big deal anyway it's not like he like do you know what i mean like if he wants to be cryogenically frozen then you know it's none of our business really it doesn't it doesn't it's not like he's you know got i don't know it's not it's not a, a fucking illegal thing to do from what i understand I honestly don't blame him you know if i had a something that was killing me and i, I thought you know my time wasn't up yet and i hadn't lived my life fully and i hadn't done uh what i want to do and i wanted to still live i'd probably you know feasibly do that so i mean i don't see why it's an issue you could say well you know philosophically is it would it be right to do that and morally would it be right and ethical to preserve your life but i mean you know lots of horrible things are happening in the world right now with ai uh great things are happening too don't get me wrong um and with with lots of different technological advancements horrible things are happening and why do those happen then you know i just don't see why it's such a big deal and why he can't do that like why why that's wrong um i'm genuinely i genuinely don't understand so if you guys have like a theory or have a reason for why people are against that please please put that in the comments because it, it just interests me as to why that's such a big deal um 
so yeah this one is kind of it's just it's just silly it's just a silly one but it's it's kind of interesting because it's all conspiracy-ish and oh they're trying to cover it up kind of conspiracy that kind of conspiracy is interesting but i just don't think it's true i don't think it, there's much basis for it robocop is about jesus so because of the sort of resurrection of robocop and his his almost i suppose you could also factor into his godly strength and power uh people think it's actually about jesus right it's another parallel to the bible and i think that's interesting but lots of things lots of films have that exact thing kill bill could be a really good one um trying to think of other films where the characters died it's superman the death of superman in the comics and even in snyder's justice league right redemption is is in a lot of things and you know these this godly power is in a lot of things uh so it's it's hard to to know uh specifically why this is about jesus but i can see a lot of parallels there especially given the fact that you know he is on the side of right and he has he does lead a different life and he is resurrected in this godly way where he's basically able to take down whoever he wants and he's able to to be so strong and like almost you know people are in awe of him when they see him you know people are shocked by him kind of like in the batman the shot in the batman where he's going into the uh, at the beginning of the film where he's going into the crime scene where you know these people are like whoa you know there's this other it's almost he's, he's almost non-human you know how they look at him and he's almost a different kind of entity and it's, i think it's the same with robocop there's a shock of like wow this is what i mean someone that's dedicated their life to this and they've got this extraordinary power and motivation and that is definitely definitely could be parallel to jesus but it could even be parallel to you know demigods and things like i'm reading uh the iliad by homer right now you know these godlike beings that could even mirror that so perhaps there's another theory in there about uh greek mythology so yeah very cool one it is just very cool it's very badass uh and you know th when you take films that are pretty cut and dry in terms of their themes and i'm not trying to slag off robocop i love, fucking love robocop it's one of my favorite films ever uh it's very it's it's a very very well made film but when you you know take pretty cut and dry concepts like that conceptual pieces that uh you know come from one idea and perhaps they don't have lots of layers and you add on to them those theories it's really cool because it really adds in on so many more aspects to the film which is always good as you know and i said that i keep saying which is always good but it is doc brown was suicidal so we all know that D good old Doc Brown, he d had no idea if the flux capacitor and the, the DeLorean was gonna work. I actually have a DeLorean here. Ha ha ha, let me do it, cool. <laughs> when this baby hits 80 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. Um, we all know he's suicidal. Oh, what? <laughs> we all know he basically isn't clear about the flux capacitor working because i mean how could he know apart from uh marty telling him how it works and and transferring that information and the knowledge you know he he's not 100 percent sure and you know given the fact he's kind of a laughing stock in the town and there are terrorists after him he could be prepared to just basically get in the delorean and you know boost off to his death as far as we know so the the theory basically says that because uh, of that um and because he takes signif significant uh risks and su uh, it basically suggests that he's ready to die and his behavior is concurrent with someone who just doesn't care anymore and i don't think it's too much of a stretch um but obviously it's not too obvious within the the, the film but it's i don't think it's much of a stretch and i think i mean it's kind of just true isn't it like we kind of know that doc he's dedicated to what he does and he's not someone who like you know he's not a person that he puts everything into what he does in his research you know and he 
it doesn't really care about anything else like too much i mean he does care about people and he cares i hope he cares about einstein the dog is horrible that he's setting him off for his poor fucking dog and i hope uh, the the dog that played him in the film was treated well but um animal abuse is fucking horrible in this industry and just in general but yeah it's kind of just true to be honest for me at least the sonic movie redesign was a publicity stunt so the abhorrent nature of sonic uh and his first design is just very clear i mean he just looks gross right and it doesn't make much sense as to why they lean so much into this realistic portrayal of the character and it also would make sense that they they knew there, there's like it's hard to understand it's hard to think that they knew or thought uh he actually looked somewhat bearable and that like i mean sonic is made for kids How, why are kids gonna wanna uh, even shrek doesn't look that bad like shrek's got more of a cartoony nature to him like this uncanny valley sort of ooh, sort of feeling you get when you look at the the original I, I just can't understand why they'd want to do you know paint him to look that way and uh put him in that that sort of have that version be represented so people think you know it was actually a re a publicity stunt to then change him back uh, i mean what if that was the original design what if the second design they did the redesign what if that was actually the real design and that they actually hadn't rendered this gross first design at all in the film maybe it was just rendered in the trailer because i seem to remember they they cleaned that that baby up pretty quick you know what i mean like they they corrected that error pretty quickly um just from my memory i believe so what if that was actually a sort of it's like you know giving someone uh you know uh, one of the a main character giving them like a really ugly haircut or just just something an aspect to them that you just oh, fucking cringy and then changing it to then give it a positive effect instead of having no effect at all because at least for me you know i don't really have any relationship with sonic or those films uh and it just looks quite you know i just don't have any feeling towards it so maybe once it make it so what well, maybe they wanted to put paint it or change it uh and make people like me sort of go oh well that looks fucking shit and then and then have a some sort of emotion towards the the second version if that makes sense for where usually i wouldn't have any emotion towards it i i don't really have much emotion towards sonic and i'm not slanging off it's just my preference this is what I just don't like it, you know, it's just not my cup of tea, basically, is exactly it. So, it would make a lot of sense, and, I mean, it's just a very interesting point in film history and in media history, you know, this, uh, a, a complete, I don't know if it's ever been done, a complete redesign after just one trailer and just so much backlash that the, oh, I suppose, in games, it's done a lot in games, isn't it, with different, you know, like EA with Battlefront 2, fucking hell most downloaded um reddit post i think of all time isn't it so it's a very interesting point in history that's for sure jack dawson is a time traveler so this theory basically posits that jack dawson from titanic which i will never see because it looks fucking overrated i'm sorry but it does and i uh really just want to never see it and my girlfriend is the same way i think she she feels the same way like it just looks so overrated that i want to if I can never see that film, um, I'm better off. Do you know what I mean? I'm happy because it just looks so overrated and that overrated nature. It was the same with um, Everything Everywhere All at Once, but uh, my girlfriend likes that film, so I ended up watching it, unfortunately. I f I'm sorry, but I fucking hate that film, man. I think it's so overrated and it's not fair that it fucking won an Oscar. Um, the performances were good and you know i don't blame them but uh, f yeah i'm not gonna get into it but i and the batman films like the batman that ha that have just so much craft put into it and so much effort put into it are just sweep swept under the rug and not even mentioned uh i think it's a fucking shame um 
personally if you like it then that's great you know that's i'm happy you enjoy it i wish i could enjoy it more than i can but uh anyway what was i talking about uh yeah so basically because of jack dawson's knowledge of events and his presence on the ship people think that he's a time traveler um and at you know at, he's on there at such a specific time uh, as well also because you know he he doesn't fit within the world of the film uh like he, for example he doesn't ha he won a ticket through gambling so that could suggest maybe he doesn't have a lot of currency within this time period it would make sense because he doesn't really fit within the world and you know that it maybe he did it quickly maybe he time traveled quickly or the device uh activated quickly or he he uh, it was a rash decision so he didn't have a lot of currency for the mission the, the whatever right uh also his story like his timeline creates a lot of uh historical inaccuracies which would also go along with uh him wanting to save rose rose's life uh, and going just making a quick decision to go and do go and time travel not caring about the minutia of it or perhaps the butterfly effect and obviously we all know that James Cameron, he's, we all know that he loves sci-fi and he loves these very grand stories that are actually in a more fantastical and again, sci-fi world. Look at aliens, look at Avatar, you know, all these things. So it could definitely be the case because of his love for that kind of cinema and his love for that kind of, those kind of stories. I don't know if he likes having twists that much, really. I can't really think of many twists, like for example, in Avatar, there's no, you know his biggest film there aren't many twists terminator 2 i suppose you could say oh well you know his relationship with uh, arnie is kind of a twist and especially at the beginning him not uh, him actually protecting him actually protecting the kid i fucking can't remember his name there's just so much going on in my brain right now that could be a twist as opposed to you know trying to kill his mum. so you could you could sort of pose those as twists and that could indicate this therefore is a twist but that's like one and it's not massive world shattering twist really but perhaps it is a bit but but the, there's also the counter argument like why didn't he stop the ship from crashing in the first place and save everyone why is he just trying to save rose's life maybe he hates the upper class and hates everyone else on there again i've not seen the film i don't know it just doesn't make sense and also how did he survive did his uh time machine or device whatever it is can he just go at a whim can he just go back and forth because like the like in doctor who the vortex manipulator you know what i mean is it something like that where he can just like that go uh, backwards and forwards and if that's the case well then why didn't he send him and rose like uh forward in time you know what i mean to save them or back in time before the the iceberg was hit no ooh, iceberg iceberg explained but yeah, rest in peace everyone who died on the Titanic is absolutely awful. It, again, it's sort of a butterfly effect to where he can't change major events, but he can save one person's life. Like, again, in Doctor Who, um, just save one person, you know. In uh, uh, The Fires of Pompeii, when the Doctor and Donna have to sacrifice Pompeii for the world, and they, they have to let this event happen also another person from Whitechapel in that come to think of it in that episode it's amazing oh my god wow I just found it found a, the Batman Doctor Who fucking connection oh, I was looking for that holy shit I'm fucking excited to tell people about that but you know like that you know he could he has to let Pompeii burn but he can save one family you know something like that could be the case Bruce named himself Vengeance, not Batman. So if you look at all the characters within the guys and the narrative of the Batman, you can see there are people that call him Batman and there are people that call him Vengeance. Now that could be that they have a relationship with that side of him, but I think that within the narrative of the film and even could be character wise, I guess, or not, I guess, but it could be. Um, it is a representation of who he really is right and his the two sides to him now we never hear bruce himself calling himself batman uh, apart from answering to the name and um, there's not much iconography within the film that would suggest that he's batman apart from you know obviously the 
emblem looks like a bat and the ears which could be subconscious and we all know how amazing uh, matt reeves is about uh, having this incredibly realistic utilitarian feel which is fucking perfect for the batman and his fucking armor and uh, costume is fucking perfect i'm looking at it right now uh a figure of him uh unmasked i'm just here to unmask the truth about this cesspool we call a city uh so i think that it's more than that you know um batman is the good side to him batman is the side to him that is uh trying to become better right i have to become more i have to become more um and vengeance which is what he th calls himself and he thinks he is uh, you know going out every night beating the shit out of people that he sees as people that killed his parents basically right that's who he is uh, or believes he is and that represents his darker uh, more vicious side so that would mean in turn that people who call him batman know who he truly is we hear riddler say that exact thing right all people want to do is unmask you but i know who what i'm looking at right now is who you really are right he it is who he is and i think we all know and subscribe to the aspect of bruce being the the persona and batman being who he really is and getting all of this trauma out and and expressing what he wants from the world and changing those things so yeah and you know a great example of of uh this these uh, aspects and this theory just in general uh being true is that you know even selena doesn't call herself catwoman and the fact that her costume and especially her beanie the ears sticking out uh isn't a deliberate thing just reinforces that idea more that uh he doesn't actually ever call himself batman and he doesn't see himself as batman i think is also very important uh, as well important aspect of this theory until the end of the film and when people think when you think about it the reason it's called the batman could be deeper it could be because it's about him becoming the batman it's not about him being the batman already and this sort of spiritual rebirth and again i think um uh, matt Eve, matt reeves even said this fucking legend and i'm looking at rob right now fucking legend everyone's a fucking legend part of this film it's perfect and when i when i talk about these theories and when i talk about these things i'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Batman. i'm not i'm not saying there are these plot holes i simply love the film to death and i just want to examine it more so i'm not saying that at all i think it's perfect by the way just so i want everyone to know um the uh, you know his baptism uh swimming around after cutting the electrical wire and you know swimming to those people it's a baptism it's a rebirth and matt even said that and it's not just a rebirth rebirth of him it's a rebirth of gotham and it's also a rebirth of how people see batman you you know there's a a the part where right after that again the mayor she doesn't subscribe to him the new mayor she does not subscribe bella real she doesn't subscribe to his ideals she doesn't agree with him but he reaches out after helping the kid which but there's a whole other uh like uh analysis i could do and i think i'll do a whole analysis video of the batman um just to get everything out there because i've just got so many things about it that i want to talk about um sort of reaching to almost a younger version of himself after you know the mayor died who is in white chapels amazing tv shows the main character of it it's almost a shame that the mayor died so early on because he's such a good actor british actor neil is in it from uh from happy valley which is another great british tv show he's also in the batman Re loads of really good british actors and connections so thank you to them and just high praise to all of them and he's also an uncle that the guy's in neil but that that represents you know him becoming batman and that's what the film is truly about i think uh, really and it could l be a literal interpretation within the film you know that he d literally you know doesn't call himself that he calls himself vengeance i mean you look at the uh, most badass fucking scene ever put on cinema right the hell are you supposed to be i'm vengeance right like i'm vengeance 
Okay, that was a bit bit better. It, it, it he literally calls himself for that, right? He doesn't say I'm Batman, like uh, you know, eight, Batman eighty nine and in Batman Begins. And I think that that's a clear clear evidence for that. So it's clear that lots of the characters aren't named. Uh, I aren't given like you know those names uh big spoilers here joker right in the unseen in the scene where that was the scene his name is actually unseen arkham prisoner and uh you know riddler is actually called riddler so that that's uh, that's i can't use that as an example but joker hasn't become joker yet and i think these rebirths and these these when these characters are reborn as these versions of other versions of themselves it's very apparent throughout the the film and i i'd say even you know throughout uh uh the apes trilogy as well uh i've seen a lot of his uh final i think final apes film and there's a lot of there are, there are a lot of that sort of biblical almost uh, iconography throughout uh that film and i think he loves those themes uh to to have that rebirth and to have those characters change like that so i think there's there's a lots of reasons and i i genuinely think he doesn't uh call himself batman until year what would be now i think year three of being batman right and well i think those are those things are all sub, uh, subconscious because he works in the bat cave and it's not even called the bat cave in the film you don't it's not mentioned that it's called the bat cave um get dressed have a shower get dressed your friends from wayne accounting are coming to visit like here now well i couldn't get you to go there it's getting serious bruce it's getting serious bruce it won't be long before you have nothing left i don't care about that any of that what, you don't care about your family's legacy? What I'm doing is my family's legacy. If I can't have an effect here, if I can't change things, I don't care what happens to me. That's what I'm afraid of. Alfred, stop it. You're not my father. I'm well aware. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, that's sad, but and then he walks off. <laughs> the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park aren't dinosaurs. So because of the inaccuracies of, for example, velociraptors in Jurassic Park, people believe that they're not actually dinosaurs. They're sort of a genetic mutation uh, engineered, not specifically as dinosaurs would have been when they were around. So people essentially believe, you know, they're these like two species mixed together or multiple species mixed together. This would obviously make a lot of sense because I mean, how can you create a creature that is completely 100% accurate to a creature that's already gone extinct. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Obviously, they're they're doing things like this, like making a mammoth, uh, bringing the mammoths back. But you can't obviously one to one ratio it. You can give a guess, but there's no way it's going to be exactly like the dinosaurs that were roaming about the ones that you know the specific ones that went extinct. But also. You know, there has to be some sort of genetic engineering there that's going to cause abnormalities. In fact, you know, who says they're not robots? Who says they're not these gigantic, you know, animatronic-like things? We, we don't know, right? There's no certainty there. Uh, perhaps there's a scene where one of them is cut open and we can see, oh, it's not a robot. It's not an android. It's not a an AI, whatever. But everything can be faked is a thing and because of the velociraptor not looking like that actually in real life and being accurate it could be something like that it could be sort of botching together different parts of different mammals and animals uh to create a, a dinosaur as opposed to you know what they describe in the film basically genetically reviving the species the narrator and tyler durden are calvin and hobbs so there are actually a lot of things that would suggest this to be 100% true. So basically Calvin and Hobbes was, from what I think, first a comic and then a cartoon. And both of these character characters are representations of uh, basically those characters in those, oh, sorry, comic strip, um, the comic strip. And I actually think that, so Calvin basically, he had an imaginary friend who in the film is unnamed which could be Hobbes. Obviously, we know Tyler Durden 
we're not 100% sure Tyler Durden is Tyler Durden and the narrator doesn't have a name so feasibly he could be Hobbs you know so that would make perfect sense there's no like I mean there's no like solid evidence to, there's no solid argument against that because we don't know his name so it's not like oh well his name is blank or whatever and even if that was the case we could go against that anyway we could say oh well he's lying but the similarities uh, are too sort of uncanny if that makes sense there was an exclusive club in Calvin and Hobbes called gross which would be basically like fight club they argue that the film explores themes of alienation and personal transformation uh, much like the philosophical and psychological undertones of Calvin and Hobbes by they argue, I mean the people who oppose this theory, um, which would make a lot of sense because, I mean, I've never read Calvin and Hobbes, but it looks quite existential in and sort of, I, I don't know how to describe it, quite, um, I don't know, somber would be a word that would come to mind. Uh, so, it, yeah, I don't see why... Uh, this couldn't be true i think it's a great little theory as well for people who love calvin and hobbs and i mean you can't go wrong with theories like this you know taking a, a, a sort of whimsical thing for kids and transforming it uh and or displaying it in something else and finding those connections in something deeper and darker we love it here we cover those theories a lot you know ned ryerson is the devil so in Groundhog Day, basically there is this one guy called Ned Ryerson and he is this guy who's a cocky sort of mocking little prick basically who essentially he's always sort of commenting on the main character who is played by Bill Murray, his situation. For example, um, when he is first introduced or like when he's first induced into the time loop Groundhog day itself ned insults phil before just or the main person i got most of this theory from is super conductive rabbi on reddit and he gives some very very good pieces of evidence to suggest that he is this this sort of benevolent demonic presence and is he's so sort of uh, twisted and he seems to have these supernatural abilities that would suggest he knows more for example, before Phil enters the loop, like, I think just before, might be wrong, he says to him, Ned says to Phil, who's Bill Murray, Bill Murray plays, watch out for the first step, it's a doozy. Now, why would he say this? It literally makes no sense that he would address this step that he's taking as his first, because there's not going to be like another puddle right in front of him. There wasn't another puddle right in front of him. And it's not like he sort of stumbled and then fell. He just put his, do you know what I mean? Like the, the specifics of that and mentioning specifically this, the first step. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense why someone would say that. Uh, or it would make sense why someone would say it, but to say it like that doesn't make much sense. Especially given he's not stepping, he's not like drunk, you know what I mean? Like he's not stepping into like 20 puddles. He steps into one. And the sort of eerie nature of it actually being his first step into the loop as well obviously would suggest how could he know that he's stepping that's his first step in the loop like there's no other way a character would be able to know unless he was a benevolent omnipotent being that you know either had control of what's going on or knew acknowledge what's going on and given the fact that he's such a prick it's easy to think he's he's a, a devil-like entity or actually just the devil, right? So it's very obvious that he, he wants to basically revel in other people's pain. And funnily enough, the act that actually breaks him free is when Phil buys insurance from Ned, literally from him, the guy that, you know, somehow knows all of this shit about him you know the first step is always mocking him always like being a just a dickhead essentially and is always always feels like he has to like uh basically take a jab at our main character right at phil and it just doesn't seem normal like again especially given that he's maniacally laughing uh so at something so like remedial and and just of no consequence really it just all of these things um would definitely suggest that there's some at least something going on more here that would suggest 
uh, some sort of demonic devil-like presence or at least something that is of a design that is controlling or aware of uh, Phil's situation. Um, there are also many symbolic aspects of the film that could hint him being the devil too, which you can find in the OP's posters. There are loads. It's a great, great place to read about that theory. Yeah, it's just very, it's very interesting. And also I wouldn't, it, it would fit into the film. I feel like, I feel like it has that fantastical pre uh, element to it. That's not, that wouldn't be beyond using the devil in a film like that. And I feel like in that landscape of cinema, in that time frame of cinema, using de uh, devil-like entities was quite common, or at least I feel it was in films like of this nature. You know, they weren't afraid of doing that. So I can, I'm completely behind this one. Um, and again, it's one of those that really makes you rethink. And that's really the purpose of all these theories and this, these videos is to make you rethink a lot of the characters and the plot points of films that you may once have believed uh, was quite cut and dry, you know. Mary Poppins is on drugs. So this is a good one. I mean, this is just a right fucking meme. As you can hear, I'm British. So Mary Poppins, she's one of our like peeps. She's one of our homies. So, I mean, this is doing us a bit dirty, I won't lie. It's doing us a bit. It's, it's fucking with our image and I just don't appreciate it now. Just, okay, no, okay. So basically because of the very bright, colorful landscape, fantastical things that happen, and also Mary Poppins' demeanor uh, within itself, people think she's on drugs. Uh, it's basically that simple. Uh, there's not much more to it, quite frankly. Um, she can fly and shit. She can basically do anything beyond the physical realm, right? And we obviously know, especially in this time frame of Disney films, there's there's like def there's definitely stuff going on that relates to a deeper meaning within those films. For example, Peter Pan has undertones of like, you know, mortality, it has undertones of like, you could even put it into the realm of like plastic surgery. There's loads of things you could do with those titles. And they're so open uh, is, it, is the, is the, thing about them and eerily open like it just feels like they're so unsubtle that it's creepy does that make sense and it's they're so obvious that it's creepy i don't i really don't know how to explain it there's probably a, a word for it definitely very li liminal space ish back rooms ish uh alice in wonderland is mental i mean it is just mental i love it to death don't get me wrong it's one of my favorite it's pro it's definitely my favorite disney thing uh, and no, I'm not counting like, you know, Star Wars and, you know, well, Doctor Who isn't owned by Disney, but now, luckily, they're just distributing it. Uh, I'm not talking about that. Well, I, I would even involve Di like Disney Star Wars because they fucked up Star Wars, but it's just, I absolutely love that. And obviously, uh, Alice in Wonderland, it's just, it's mental. I mean, there's just so much going on in there that, you know, definitely point towards something more adult more adult themes as well as you know Winnie the Pooh and there's also a, which would be a, a deep dive into mental health and each each of the characters representing different mental disorders um and also there's this there, uh, Pin Pinocchio there's a scene that is terrifying where they're talking about collecting and uh, whew, I don't know how to say this without getting like getting wrecked by YouTube collecting men but not like but before they're men there you go or i think bad and then men before they're men and rounding them up and taking them to pleasure island i mean come on like that's that is f weird for i don't care about like what i don't care what you say oh oh let's just try to it's trying to scare kids so they don't do this or that but it's like the the ties to epstein there the ties to human trafficking terrifying you know really f just gr just just if you watch the scene you can go and watch the scene it's really oh yeah uh and yeah we know they're pieces of garbage over at disney so you know with the animal abuse as i've talked about i think as well uh air buds look into that that's horrific and you know the kid who all he wanted you know i think two years old he was he was and died and they wouldn't even let him have fucking spider-man on his grave 
What the fuck, man? They're, they're monsters over there, so I wouldn't put it past them, basically. Star Wars is a story told from R2-D2's perspective. This is another one like the Jurassic Park one in this here, where it's, it, it's again, it's not really a, th I don't know, I wouldn't know how to, to describe this one. I wouldn't even put it, if it was me, I wouldn't, I'm not slagging off whoever made this iceberg, because it's a really good iceberg, but it's sort of not a theory as much of a, a sort of analysis of the film. Do you get what I mean? Um, I suppose it's a bit different for the Jurassic Park one because that's less about plot and, and uh, sort of characters. It's more about the minutia of it. So that makes more, that would make more sense. But this one is like entirely based around editing the actual plot itself and how it ties into the characters, the writing, how, how the characters are written and just, just the overall, I suppose, feel of the film. Uh, is, is how this is approached and I wouldn't yeah again I wouldn't put it I wouldn't say it's a theory it's more like an analysis and it actually has a lot of grounds in reality if you watch The Hidden Fortress by Akira Kurosawa really good film which George Lucas has said was a big influence on Star Wars you can see I mean like literally the two characters that R2 and C3P are based on are the two characters of that film and it's a very it's very very similar it's very very similar how they're depicted uh and, and the editing and the writing around them is very uh very similar and it would make sense because i mean r2 could potentially you could even make the point that he's the protagonist of the film he's the one carrying the main plot device of the entire film he's the one guarding it carrying it so it, yeah it would make a lot of sense and Chuck Noland is unknowingly stuck in a reality show. So basically, the main character of Castaway, which, don't shoot me, I haven't seen, I want to see it, okay? But the main character, the theory is that the main character is in a sort of Truman Show uh, scenario, where, uh, you know, obviously he's being broadcasted for people's amusement, uh, amusement, and basically it's all one big setup simulation uh, set. The sort of examples or pieces of evidence that people have is the fact that he's basically able to, able to survive certain circumstances, which suggests that it's a reality show and that, you know, none of this is real. Perhaps when he's sleeping, they give him certain nutrients things like that and the fact that you know he's basically able to endure all this shit out the circumstances and i think he's a postman if i if i'm right uh, like he's not a survivalist so i mean again i haven't seen it i think this would make sense in terms of cinematic influence because i think castaway was made a bit before Ca uh <laughs> a bit before castaway castaway was made a bit before castaway before the truman show which i think the truman yeah the truman show is definitely 1999 so it was around the same time so in terms of cinematic influence as to why the director or writers would want to do that it would make a lot of sense the breakfast club are in purgatory the title says it all but mostly the evidence is what's I suppose the most interesting in this or the the claims uh, so I was doing a lot of sort of I suppose you could say research and thinking on this this particular theory because I love the breakfast club and this gives it a whole new life for me because I sort of fell out of love with it for a bit uh, over the last uh, year year and a half two years maybe so this sort of breathes a, lot, breathes a lot of fresh air into it so firstly why is the school open and fully lit on a saturday why is every like every single hallway is lit every part of the school basically that we see is lit even the vents are lit up right when bender's going through the the ventilation system secondly there's a point in the film that i noticed on research looking for clips at the beginning uh of the film where uh, i think it's vernon the the teacher that's watching them says don't mess with the bull and bulls in christianity basically represent the want for a more spiritual uh life beyond like animalistic instincts and they basically the represent the desire for peace as well which 
would be a direct symbol within the film of a sort of the the characters wanting to leave purgatory you know uh repent for their sins discuss their sins at least and be able to be free and like you know pass on to heaven or whatever belief right this isn't just a belief for christianity by the way or uh catholic catholicism sorry this could be implemented into any religion because i think most religions have a purgatory uh or something similar and could even you know and spiritually you know it, it's just interesting purgatory for me sort of other ethereal realms like that are very interesting and intrigue me a lot so that would make a lot of sense they want to they want to have solace and peace and through that the ability to move on to be free their souls you know be free from sin whatever you you think uh this could represent or also you know your religion that's a good thing about this one is that it's it's quite an open one to where you know it could be any religion really uh, i mean i don't again i don't know if lots of religions have a purgatory but i'm sure they do another thing that's within the theory is that bender is actually an angel and he's testing everyone that's why he sort of goes back and forth in terms of like his allegiance you know at, at the very beginning of the film you just think oh this guy's a cunt this guy's a dickhead and then as the film goes on he sort of becomes a good more sacrificial person so what if the first part was a veneer and the second part the latter part of his character was the 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 reality obviously it could be the other way around it could be that he's a demon right or perhaps he's a demon that's transforming into an angel we're watching his transformation there's another theory as well that my mum told me so shout out to my mum that it's the entire film is in uh the the one that the outsider her perspective of a dream because she becomes pretty she gets the guy she gets everything she wants she gets you know she gets all she gets to do all this stuff without like real consequence um and she also doesn't look like you know she doesn't nothing f is fearful to her and there's a dreamlike essence to the breakfast club that would also support that and support this theory for the most part for example like the outside of the school from what i remember and i, I don't think i was able to find many clips of that or any it's a quite a a, a bright exterior uh, it, it's almost angelic it's almost you know represents some sort of ethereal plane and just the the strange architecture of the school as well would represent that uh, also don't you forget about me that's not talking about their you know them meeting and then going off and uh, hanging out with who they usually would you know doing the usual things that they would within their lives I mean that wouldn't make any sense anyway because they're all they're all changed after this we know that that's the whole point of the film they're, they're they've all become better people and they've changed and they've they've opened themselves up right this it actually means don't you you know don't you forget about me because they're dead right because they've passed on that's why they should, no one should people shouldn't forget about them so that's a really good one i love that that part there's also another thing about the the angelic nature or that benders working uh, for some sort of other being uh, godly being is the end when he is walking across the uh i think football field or american football field baseball field i'm not sure when he's walking through firstly he's walking away like he's not with anyone else which wouldn't make any sense why aren't they all like hanging out together after this or at least hey, why isn't he hanging out with claire she wouldn't care about what her parents thought she's gone through a transformation right why why does she care that's because she's he's walking onto another that's because he's walking onto another uh, mission i suppose you call it uh to save other people's souls right and send them off to heaven right and free their souls and he also he punches up to the air and looks up to the air and he's got sunglasses on as well which would represent or not represent but which would you know mean well why has he got it's not like it's literally the um it's what it's sort of the time that it is now it's becoming sunset right the sun's going down why does he need sunglasses on 
um so this is like he, he maybe he's looking up to god looking up to heaven looking up to a godly being that's so bright that he can't you know he has to put sunglasses on uh, and obviously he's looking up and he's happy that he succeeded in his mission right of helping these people the architecture of it doesn't make a lot of sense and there are prison sort of prison gar bars uh, that would symbolize, you know, purgatory. You can't just leave purgatory, right? It's like a prison, but that could represent a mental prison. And the amount of stuff they're like able to get away with and like, pardon me, uh, just sneak past Vernon uh, like while running is mental, right? But yeah, this is one of my favorites of all time. Lots of theories have purgatory. Lots of film theories use purgatory, but I think this actually has real grounds to suggest that, you know? It's amazing. I love this theory. James Bond is a Time Lord. So this theory really patches up a lot of the age problems with James Bond. Now, I'm not sure if every film addresses him as James Bond. Uh, I, I'm really not sure about that. But the age, the, the problem with the age of him, you know, he's like all one second he's 50, then he's like 40 or like 30 or whatever. It doesn't make a lot of like it doesn't make any sense, actually. Sorry. Um, and it would be patched up a lot with, you know, him being a Time Lord, uh, which I've loved Doctor Who, loved Doctor Who ever since I was like three, you know, well, probably early, earlier than that. Um, and it's just very close to me. And lots of things could be patched up with those characters being Time Lords. I'm not saying, you know, throw it about, but some things when you, you know, really analyze it could, right? And this is definitely one of them. Look at, you know, Peter to Jody, right? Look at even Tom to Peter Davison. Look at um, John Pertwee to Tom, right? That all of these uh, big changes, eat, well, one of the big ones would be Matt Smith to Peter Capaldi, right? Lots of big age changes there. We all know uh, Time Lords can age physically different throughout each incarnation, right? So that's not a stretch at all. And by, you know, as far as I know, they could, I think, transform into other species. Um, I'm not sure about that, that part, though, because I don't think we've ever seen that. Uh, no, I don't think we have. But yeah, um, this one patches up a lot of problems and molds to really uh, good. But I'm more close to Doctor Who, so I'm going to say Doctor Who's better, obviously. Uh, and I just think it is. It's I think it's the best TV show ever made. I really do. Um, but yeah, James Bond, you know, all the James Bond fans uh, can be happy as well with like, you know, the continuity possibly being fixed with that. Uh, and yeah, I love, again, I've said before, I love Skyfall. Uh, and there's some James Bond films that are just incredible, but it's not like, it's not something I'd go and watch all of them with, right, personally. Um, but some of them are really, really good. Like, like I said, Skyfall. But um yeah this one's a really i don't know it's a really nice one it's like a really uh yeah it's a good one and it's interesting when you when you start to think about the mechanics of it you know humans are actually insects in star wars so this is a really weird one definitely go off and like read the whole article about this but it basically yeah it's it's the title says it all essentially there's like a hierarchy it, it, it really to be kind of honest with you it didn't make too much sense to me but it, there are a few parallels like the emperor having to create clones so that there can be normal reproduction because he's like the queen or the king or the the emperor of all the bees and the insects the Death Star, uh, the Death Stars, both Death Stars were actually artificial hives, and lightsabers actually sound like bees buzzing. Uh, so they're actually, what if they're actually like, you know, stingers basically? There, there's just some plethora of uh, of th points that posit this uh, and support this. So I highly recommend if you're interested in this one, go and check it out. Uh, but yeah, basically goes through. The fact that you know everyone like everyone's an insect and there's a hierarchy and it's it's quite complicated in a way um to to sort of explain but those are the, the sort of big pieces of evidence that that were like interesting things that sort of came out to me like uh popped up popped out to me michael myers is a cyborg so some people think because of his like immortality 
Michael Myers is a cyborg and I actually think that there is another point to this that would make a lot of sense which is he keeps coming back for the same family he keeps coming back to kill the same family right which would make sense in a in an androids sense of programming right it's coming back to essentially kill the same person because the programming hasn't changed so that would make a lot of sense and I, like the things he survives like i've only seen halloween 19 mid, mid 1978 late 70s early 80s and you know the fact that he survives all of the inflictions in that film is absolutely insane i've watched a bit of uh halloween 2018 as well but yeah, we know there are a lot of Halloween films and lots of things happen to him and he has like no emotion whatsoever, which would also make sense that he's a cyborg as well. Or I guess, well, cyborg suggests half human, half uh, uh, robot, but maybe he's maybe he's got a robot brain like programming and the rest of it is him is like human or like he has enhanced uh, organs. So that, that still works, I think, most. Paul Dano dies at the beginning of Swiss Army Man. So we all know that this film is absolutely mental. Like there's, there's so many fantastical things that happen in it. And the theory basically says that essentially at the beginning of the film, he dies and that's why he's able to communicate with this corpse so much. And sort of the end is him like coming to terms with his death. Lots of films have this theory. We've already covered Breakfast Club it is the exact same thing, except it's more to do with purgatory, but it goes along the same, you know, it's along the same lines. I think this one pretty much works just given the fact that everything that happens in this film is so unrealistic. But I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong like Drive. That's a dreamlike film. And I like Drive before all the film bros liked it, okay? I remember someone called me a film bro once because that was on my letterbox. It's like, bro, I, I invented the film bro, okay? Well, not just me, but like people I, I've, I've known as well. They've liked before all that. But I think it actually makes a lot of sense. Like Manny using Hank as a jet ski while he's farting <laughs> you know there's just so many things in it that point towards that and uh it basically you know again through lots of films we don't know if his perspective or manny's perspective is real uh, and it could also be that hank is a reflection of manny because he's already dead right so that that would make a lot of sense i, I quite like this one um in terms of like purgatory death theories i think it sticks the landing quite a bit fiona from shrek is a cannibal so the Just Nobody's podcast sort of gave me this idea, the idea to put this in. I think it's Just Nobody's. So there's a scene where I think Shrek is like walking with Fiona out of the castle when he, after he's quote unquote saved her. And you can see a giant book, How to Cook a Knight. That was obviously for the dragon, because why is it a giant book? Why, why would you need a giant book? Realistically, the dragon, I think is Elizabeth, I actually found out as well, from, from the same podcast I just mentioned. Uh, she she's just gonna eat that night like whole basically right like she's not worried about it cooking uh, it and maybe you know uh, there's also it ties into the theory that again just nobody's podcast that she was once a princess as well and she was turned into like Fiona was turned into an ogre uh, was turned into a dragon perhaps like Lord Farquaad it's fucking hilarious and like what else is she eating there because like you look at the castle there it's run down there there's nothing in terms of like storage really there i don't think it just it's completely dilapidated right so there are a lot of lot of pieces of evidence that would suggest this to be 100 true basically and you know you can't i, I wouldn't put it past the, the shrek creators you know beetlejuice is the ghost of batman to be honest this one doesn't really work like whatsoever the only thing that is a piece of evidence for this is that there are like during like one sequence where Beetlejuice is like sort of being like a carnival, like he becomes like this weird carnival thing. There are wings attached to him and that's it basically. And it's Michael Keane. That's it. That's literally it. That's all I could find at least. This one definitely shouldn't be this far down and it, it's just not that good. It's not that good this one. It's not a very good theory in my opinion. The Riddler in the Batman is actually Hush. So we know that uh, Edward is very proficient in giving multiple identities and giving away, sort of suggesting different identities. But one one scene in the film that really sort of makes me believe that it's the case is he gives two identities to the to the cops, to Ramirez specifically. <clears throat> and it doesn't make much sense why he'd want to 
I suppose because he it's like a mini riddle of like like so he gives two different identities uh, I'm sure you guys remember one is Edward Nashton and then one is uh Edward I forgot what the other one is uh and they're ba they're very similar uh and he's saying you tell me and they're like which one is real why do like a five second thing for that do you know what I mean like why troll them for like five seconds for them to check and then go oh, okay he's this guy that makes me suggest that neither of them are real and that he's actually Elliot Thomas Elliot because firstly he grew up alongside Bruce and there's actually in the prequel novel there's a scene where Bruce looks at Riddler in during the scene where Thomas announces he's gonna run for mayor Thomas Wayne there's a scene where they make eye contact they both like wear like sort of bandage sort of things you know what I mean? Like duct tape is kind of, it, it's very reminiscent of bandages in a way, if you look at it, you know, these strips like wrapped around them, very similar. And he's such a, no pun intended, enigmatic individual, mysterious individual that I think he would have another thing up his sleeve that, you know, a third thing, third ident identity, right? He's a very smart man. Also his anger at Bruce in his video, exposing Thomas Wayne, like we know he's he gets angry about corruption but his just anger towards thomas wayne just and bruce in again in the prequel novel and and it, well even in the scene where he's being interrogated right it it would suggest that there could be something more a more personal thing going on there and that they actually had more of a relationship as hush and bruce did in the comics it also would be an interesting layers ad but it's not you know i don't personally believe it but it's one that i don't know it's just a cool theory man hopefully they do hush in uh, the Batman part two there are rumors that that will happen so I'm very excited for that and Clayface very excited legend fucking Matt Reeves are, they're, they're all legends but yeah very excited the only like thing is like counter argument wise is Matt Reeves is very good at giving us clues and hinting us towards a certain thing and there are some easter eggs that aren't doing that are very symbolic and very hidden as you can find in my hidden symbolism series that uh hopefully part two will be out soon so he's a bit more deliberate with that so it wouldn't make sense that he'd be hush in that sense in a narrative writing way but then again he writes with another writer i can't remember his name very good writer so they could be meshing those those styles there uh, but it feels like it, it's quite unintentional if it is the case and that's why i don't really believe it to be honest it, it doesn't it, there's just no real evidence apart from elliot being mentioned and the the things things i've said Spider-Man Far From Home is about school shootings. This one was quite difficult for me to actually pin down on what, what, it, what it sort of meant. But essentially what it's saying is in the world of the MCU, the aftermath of the blip, it's very similar to school shootings, right? The fact that this big event happens, the desensitization of all the kids to events like school shootings and, you know, that it's actually about that and about their sort of nonchalant way of talking about the blip, which would represent school shootings. And there's actually a really good article that you can read about it. The fact that like anxiety is risen after the blip, just like there are school shootings. It would actually make sense as well, like why they, every character would be so like nonchalant and just so like relaxed because obviously they're, they're superheroes. So they're not afraid of, of something like that. And that's why they just don't worry about it too much. It's all, t all about going back to normality after trauma and after something that's uh, horrible has happened. So it doesn't mean specifically, you know, like a school shooting happened in, actually happened in the film. It's more like an allegory, if that makes sense, which is really, really, really interesting. I actually really, this one is fascinating to me. The Last Jedi is about sex. <laughs> so basically because of the sort of themes of, in this film of like awakening, people believe could represent sexual awakening sexuality pardon me uh sexual expression and there is there's also lots of imagery uh in terms of like physical imagery between your know, kylo and ray you know touching which could represent oh you know a, a more intimate thing there's the scene where obviously he has his shirt off and she's quite uncomfortable and like oh you know what i mean she sort of looks him and looks at him in a weird way uh, so it's like basically saying that this film is about sexual awakening. You could also say, you know, like the this, this scene where she dips her hand in the forest, that could be an allegory for sexuality. Uh, the inside of the tree and that they go into it and it 
which doesn't really i don't really think that one has anything to do i think that's just a cool set piece um and just the, the tension is weird i think is the main thing between kylo and ray like it's so it there's no real purpose for it in terms of like why why is this happening apart from them to like get together because ryan johnson probably wanted that to happen because he wants to do something different as he always fucking does so yeah it's it's an interesting one to think about in terms of allegorically but i think that there's not any real evidence for it apart from a few things there that could be pulled upon but it's, it's still an interesting allegory and adds again you know layers to to the film that's for sure the dark knight is a retelling of the book of job so basically because of bruce's love and protection and dedication to gotham people think that it's a parallel to the book of job uh basically job he doesn't he never wavers in his beliefs in god he never gives up uh never give up never surrender i don't know where that's from but it just came out um he's resistant to any of that bullshit right he's always he always continues to keep going and keep pushing on and people think because of that and perhaps some some sort of statuesque symbolism and some sort of like you know he's a symbol batman's a symbol could also be a parallel to job i'm sure that people have made different comments on this but i think that is the main piece of evidence that really is the most important or the most convincing kermit the frog calls 9-11 <laughs> so i struggled to say that without laughing but it's an absolute meme like when you say it out loud like just try just say that out loud just say it out loud and you'll know, you'll know what i mean so basically there's a part of the one of the muppet christmas smash specials sorry where we see a glimpse into like a universe where kermit the frog didn't uh, didn't exist and the twin towers are still up <laughs> which is fucking weird uh so this basically suggests that what if like you know indirectly or directly kermit uh calls 9-11 which is just hilarious it's just fucking hilarious and um it's just funny it's just i know i'm not trying to be uh insensitive to people who suffered during 9-11 or anything it's, it's just the fact that Kermit the fucking frog did it. It's, it's the funny part. Bo is Afraid takes place inside Bo's dying mind. So basically, there is, is so much random shit that goes on in Bo is Afraid that makes it incoherent in a way. But instead of sort of putting all, those, all of those together and perhaps uh, tying it to mental illness, T uh, tying it to trauma and tying it to specific reflections it ties into one whole thing which is that the entire film again takes place inside his dying mind throughout the whole film we see lots of mentions of death uh, especially in terms of drowning there's there are many sequences where uh, it's it looks as if that is a big parallel there's a traumatic event that Bo sees where uh, he's drowning in the tub and he's seeing his pr twin brother. There's the, v the very end of the film with the boat twitching. And basically what it says, what this posits is that he's already starting to die. And this is all it's sort of him recapping and retelling his life uh, through his mind. Right. And also imagining a lot of things, hallucinating most of it. Uh, and that it ends finally in him again admitting death which we've talked we've touched upon many times but this one i honestly th it's the most uh the one this is probably the death death theory purgatory theory that i love the most because for me Bo is afraid just didn't make a lot of sense especially in terms of like uh ari aster's other works even for ari aster this film was uh uh quite absurd and quite surrealist so it would make a lot of sense uh and i mean like you know you guys probably know the attic scene itself is ridiculous and just doesn't make any sense in a literal sense but also even in a metaphorical sense so perhaps you know perhaps he's dying close to his mum and his mum is like with him that's why she's sentencing him that's why she pretends to be dead or something uh, maybe something like that's happening. Perhaps it's her by his bedside and uh, 
he think or maybe she survived a boat the boat crash and he didn't uh and he's like in hospital and he's slowly dying but i think it would make a lot of sense the absurdity of it the angry birds movie is right-wing propaganda so basically it's everything's in the title of this one uh, because the characters talk about certain things or propagate certain values, people think it's right-wing propaganda. This is usually the case, as we've seen in the other tiers, uh, for kids' films or kids' movies or animations like this, that people basically make the assumption that they're right-wing propaganda, they're trying to manipulate kids, you know, brainwash people. Obviously, it's ridiculous because of... I mean, it's an Angry Birds movie, like, seriously. But it's interesting, as, as all of these are. I don't think it is right-wing propaganda for obvious reasons. I mean, wouldn't they put it in some other kind of content? Like, wouldn't they put it in, I don't know, anything that's more popular than the Angry Birds movie? Do you know what I mean? And if they're paid off to, to do that, like... It's really not gonna, I don't think they're gonna really believe that they're gonna yield results from that, given that you know, it's an Angry Birds movie, it's not like a Pokemon movie or something, like a big franchise, it's like a small thing that like didn't even need to be made into a movie, quite frankly. The Real Journal of the Wills. So basically this theory speculates the existence of a supposed authentic Journal of the Wills uh, as a source material for Star Wars, separate from George's uh, original vision, creative vision. Uh, it's based on the idea that he might have drawn inspiration uh, from ancient texts, or real, actual real texts, real world source material to create Star Wars, which is somewhat true actually, so that's based on reality. He did base it on myths and legends. So like the reason people bring this up is because terms like Journal of the Wills in the original Star Wars script uh, are suggestive of hidden or authentic sources. And this one's kind of based in reality so it's more easy to believe because yeah as I said we know that he based uh, his films on fact or not facts sorry on uh, actual documents or not documents but actual myths legends right it's about religion it's about legend so that makes it more based in reality which then in terms of the leap that he basically, you know, made it based on that, I don't know, it's a bit, like, far in terms of the accuracy of that, like, we'd have to have access to that document, we'd have to have access to that story for us to know, and he, there, subsequently, he would have to have enough access to that uh, uh, kind of story for which he could pull it from, and more or less what they're saying, plagiarize, right? And as far as I know, I don't think there's any myths, there are any myths that are exactly like Star Wars, because again, yeah, we know about it, right? So it's more of a speculative one, but um, it's interesting to think like one of the greatest movie franchises ever made is simply a myth from a, a ancient text, and that's it, do you know what I mean? Riddler and Carmine know Bruce is Batman. So we obviously get the big hint, spoilers for the Batman, that Riddler knows uh, that Bruce Wayne is Batman throughout the sort of end of the second act uh, or the middle, no, I think it's at the end of the second act. Uh, we see the suggestive uh, idea of, you know, I know the real you, I know who you are uh, through uh, Riddler's pictures and everything and uh, Bruce being crossed off and Bruce being on the posters that he might know Bruce Wayne is Batman, right? It's a big, big suggestion there. Um, the reason that I think it could be possible is because we know Riddler is very meticulous in when he uses information, when he uh, exposes people. He knows what exactly when the time is right to uh, expose these things, right? To get what he wants in turn by, by exposing those things. So it could be possible that he's waiting for the right time, possibly with his collaboration with the Joker. Maybe even he, you know, deliberately got himself, well, we know he deliberately got himself caught. And he wasn't even, I don't think, planning on escaping because he said we could be safe here when he's talking to Batman, when being interrogated. So maybe he was doing it deliberately to team up with Joker, who knows? Um, it's definitely a possibility that he was He's now waiting to expose him and he just he's teasing him because he knows he knows that he knows 
uh, like Riddler knows that Batman knows he knows he's uh, Bruce's Batman and he's waiting for the right time so that's interesting and in terms of Carmine Falcone there's an amazing uh, Riddler Reddit uh, comment that made me think this the scene of his death is very reminiscent of uh, Bruce sit, standing on the stairs watching uh, uh, his father um, do surgery on him uh, uh, like he was like before when he when he was shot so that makes him think and you can see a shocked expression when he dies that makes him believe hold on this is a bit similar here this is Bruce Wayne and therefore knows he's Batman just before he dies and it would make sense it's it's a really cool symbol either way and a really cool uh, heart back to uh, that and use sort of using that in a sense to make him believe that he's uh, he's Bruce Wayne although you know it was used really well in the film uh, and also was a really good reference to the long Halloween not slagging it off of course I love I think it's perfection Pinocchio is about pedophilia. So there's a specific scene I'm sort of talking about here where in the Pinocchio movie, one of the characters says, um, bad boys go to Pleasure Island or something. Bad boys are sent there. And obviously Pleasure Island could be, there's many people, many people think that Pleasure Island is Epstein's Island, um, which is also kind of ties into this theory. But uh, in the original story, it's actually about re taking revenge for a revenge fantasy showing consequences for bad behavior, um, obviously with his nose and everything, right? So what if it's actually about those people liking that being, you know, I'm not going to say it too much because I'll get fucking blocked from the internet. Uh, and th we all know there are some weird sh things in Disney movies, you know, the... Uh, the suggestive stuff, the, there was that, the stars uh, in Lion King, it's sex, there was that one bit where it looked like the, um, in, I can't remember which film, but he looked like the person who was marrying uh, two people had an erection. It's, it's not funny because it's made for kids, but it's, um, it's very interesting because we know that they're capable of doing this kind of thing uh, in terms of, um, implementing those kind of suggestive themes in their films so i don't know it's up to you to decide this one because it's so cryptic the fox and the cat also are in the disney versions are portrayed as thieves and sex traffickers kind of because you know obviously they that's their job they, they basically take they lure they literally lure him with candy pinocchio with candy cigarettes and promise of no rules uh and then obviously the the evil man said stupid that's it stupid little boys go to Pleasure Island, uh, children lose their innocence as well as a big theme in Pinocchio, never coming back as boys, which is something that they say as well, he says they, they don't come back as boys, they come back as men, I think is something, and the, uh, uh, there's also the dark implication that money is power, uh, sometimes used for evil, I think it's good that Disney are putting it in, if they're putting it in for the right reasons, I think it's good um, to expose that. But either way, obviously, it's a kid's film, so it's probably just a coincidence. But also, it kind of makes you think a bit. It's interesting, though, but as, as I always say at the end of every fucking series, or theory, I need to shut up because I'm saying it. Star Wars original editions never existed. So this is just a mental one. I don't believe this one at all. Um, people basically say uh, the special editions uh, of Star Wars, the original editions without the... George Lucasified bullshit special effects is 100% uh, fake, basically, which is fucking bullshit. Um, people testify who have seen the original version that different parts of the score are different. There are things that are cut out. There's actual evidence of the original special editions that people have scanned. Um, that where you can see the different versions, the original version and the new version. So what they fucking made that all up and then do you know what I mean? Ridiculous. So this one's just, I don't believe this one whatsoever. I'm not even going to give it any more time of day. I think it's stupid. Machete will cause a race war. So Machete is a Robert Rodriguez film, primarily viewed as a comic book sort of revenge fantasy, like Pinocchio just talking about revenge fantasy. Um, and it's basically 
uh, people are saying, uh, like right-wing people say that the film portrays virtuous Mexican day laborers in conflict with villainous drug lords and murderous Anglo border vigilantes using exaggerated and style stylized violence. Basically, some conservative, pardon me, critics, uh, like fucking Fox News, they're all right-wing cunts. Uh, blah 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 blah. They basically say that it's uh, trying to cause a race war because it's anti-American. Blah blah blah. It's but really it's just about Mexican people, you know, having more power than they do because they're minorities. So as soon as minorities, you know, basically uh, say, oh, we don't like this, or they try to make a film about it, all these right-wing cunts just come in and go, oh, it's an anti-American. It's like, well. We all have a right to an opinion. This isn't fucking 1984, Georgia, or Ali. Fucking what, what? What? So we can't make any films anymore, can we? And uh, there were riots at the time as well uh, that people think are directly linked to the film. Um, I think again, it's just. I think Robert, Robert Rodriguez is just an amazing filmmaker who wants to wants to make films and wants people to think. I really don't think he w would want to create a race war. He seems like a very fucking chill guy. If you've watched any interviews with him, he's a very inspired, chill, relaxed guy. I mean, he's like the last person I'd imagine to want to cause a fucking race war. Um, so yeah, I think it's just based in, the, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. They haven't done their research, clearly. Uh, although I can understand why they think that it's somewhat because of there were riots at the time, but that doesn't mean they're directly linked. So yeah, this is all kind of political stuff that I'm not too interested in, but it's interesting how much of an effect a film can make. That is the interesting part, because um, so many films have made, have had big effects on people, uh, on the political climate, on the economic climate, and that's what they're for. And if as soon as you take that away, you take away freedom and you take away the right to think, basically. And it becomes Orwellian, like I said. So, yeah. The Dark Knight Rises is with the Obama campaign. So this is all starting to seem very right right wing stuff. This is kind of similar to the Machete one because basically, the idea of this theory is because basically, <laughs> Vane has a name that is similar to a uh, company associated with Mitt Romney, who's a uh, part of the, I think, something to do with the Obama campaign or something. I'm not good with politics on this. He questioned whether the name, basically the guy who wrote it, questioned whether the name of the villain was accidental, which it was. Bane was around a very, very long before uh, the fucking Obama campaign. Conspiracy theory extends to the previous appearance of Bane in the 1997 film Batman and Robin, which Arnold Schwarzenegger and George Clooney are fighting, basically. Because uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a Republican and George Clooney is a liberal activist or whatever. So it's like symbolic of, oh, we're beating the Republicans. It's just ridiculous. And he, again, the guy who wrote this article is pointing at sinister connections by pointing out the British origins of the film's director, Nolan and cast member Christian Bale, Mike Payne, and Tom Hardy. I don't see how that, them being British, has to do with their political connections. That's just fucking racist, xenophobic. No way. Fucking hell. It's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous, this one. I'm not even going to give it any more time of day. Fucking hell, man. It's ridiculous. Uh, Bane came out. Bane was around a long before this. Bane was around in... I think Bane came... Bane was first shown in the Nightfall storyline, which was about 80s, I think, 70s, maybe. Um, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Danny has been sexually abused by Jack. So it's obvious in the film something's going on between Danny and his father, Jack. Uh, we can see there's some sort of abuse going on with his anger and just the way he, he treats Jack, uh, Danny. So here are some big pieces of, of evidence. The bear costume being a dog instead of a bear, as it was in the book. So that could mean, oh, it's like more of a childlike thing. Um, the bear motif also shows up a lot in bedroom scenes with Danny, which clearly represents the location of the abuse. Uh, by the way, all of this is uh, cited in the, the, where I got all of this is cited in the description, as it is usually. Uh, also, the fam framed picture of two bears, one lower and one standing, could be a comparison to the disturbing bear costume scene. 
Uh, Jack is also reading a Playgirl magazine with one of the articles titled on the cover being Incest, Why Parents Sleep With Their Children, which we all know. Um, Kubrick is very, very meticulous with his props, with his imagery, with everything. So we can't just brush that off. Uh, although it might not suggest their relationship is like that. It might just be a hint towards the metaphorical uh, uh, connotations of their relationship. It might not mean that that's actually happening in the film. Uh, the scene with Danny talking about Tony is also one, could be one big innuendo. Uh, first, he doesn't have any, he's basically in his underwear, which is weird. Uh, he covers his groin area in a similar way to Jack in a scene between him and Danny. Uh, it's just a very, very weird, um, some very weird sort of iconography that is hard to overlook. And we know, obviously, Kubrick, he's not afraid of, of showing these things in his films, and he's not afraid of tackling these big issues in modern society and any society. Um, we, we definitely know that with Clockwork Orange, all of his films. Uh, also, the Danny, the shot of Danny brushing his teeth being similar to the shot of the bear scene is very weird. The woman in room 237 is like could be a manifestation of Danny's disgust with his fa father after the abuse. There's there's many things um, that I've linked. The uh, there's an amazing article on this uh, by I forget his name, um, but he's an amazing uh, he does amazing analysis of films. So I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, but it's it really you, it really makes you think that perhaps there's something more to this and perhaps uh, yeah that is happening but you know we know Kubrick doesn't fully uh, address these things he sort of layers it in his films every movie is real so here we are the final 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 theory uh, I was gonna do some more dark ones for this tier, but I decided them. I decided to sort of defer those, and um, they were more related to uh, sort of what happened behind the scenes of the film, which technically could go in this uh, this video. But I just didn't. I just wasn't up for the darkness that came with it. Really, I just decided to take him take him out. It really fucked up um, real events that that happened. So, we're going to get into the final theory. So, I, I did a lot of research into this one, actually, and I came up with a big theory um, that essentially, there, basically, when we look at a black hole, it's not completely black. And it's actually, there is actually gray matter, and just excuse my sort of how I uh, discuss this, how I talk about this, because I'm not a physicist but essentially there is in a black hole it's not completely black particles there are gray particles and when we see those particles and they come out of a black hole they're 2d now my how i link this to this theory is perhaps films are real in another universe and they're streaming back at us uh through black holes right because we know there are basically other dimensions that are 2D because the particles are 2D when they come out of the black hole. So what if every film we see is real? What if every film we see is just another dimension and it's almost streaming back at us through a higher dimension that we can't see? And that's how we get the ideas because they're actually real. Um, so that is something to definitely think about. There's also the idea that is very plausible that our dimension is a hologram that our dimension is a hologram and this actually plays into the black hole formation because basically it wouldn't make sense that we're seeing these dimensions when black holes uh, this black hole that they're looking at represents life before uh, we existed before the big bang before creation so it would make sense that every the, the extra dimensions are are just holograms and that could also tie into the fact that you know we actually could be living in a 2d world and everything else is just a hologram of projection so that is very very interesting to think about and it really makes you wonder about the universe and about our reality our existence um, 
but the counter argument obviously is that like you're, it's ridiculous what the fuck are you talking about there's no real evidence that, to suggest to link that with films being real but but that's no fun is it you know what i mean um yeah, what, what if we're just a lowly reality for a much more dense and higher dimensional world? You know what I mean? What if we're actually a smaller slice of what is something else? Or what if we're more than another dimension that's only 2D? The entropy of the objects for which are 2D. Um, yeah, makes you, makes you really wonder. Um, yeah, what if... Everything is real. All the films are real. Who knows? Think about that one. <laughs> and that is the end of the film fan theories iceberg. Now this has been absolute, an absolute ride and a half, guys. Um, and yeah, thank you all so much for the support. Thank you all so much for being here. I might be doing another iceberg. We'll see how it goes. But yeah, I really appreciate it. And this has been fucking crazy, man. It's been great. Talk to you guys later. Take care of yourselves. And uh, I'll see you out there. And you're fine.